Hello and welcome to the second session in our series on architecture and philosophy. What can architects learn from philosophy? Uh, this is part of the, uh, the doctoral consortium that was established over the summer by Philip Yan and myself as a way of creating a platform for doctoral students and would-be doctoral students worldwide. The idea of everyone operating individually in their own classrooms with their individual professors um, doesn't make complete sense anymore now that we can share a global platform. And also, of course, this is part of the Digital Futures Initiative to try and democratise education to, by bringing educational ideas all over the world. And I'm pleased to say today that we have some, uh, we have some, some professors and students from, from all over, including Iraq and uh, Bangladesh and Iran and so on. So today, um, we'll be looking at Jean Baudrillard. Um, I'm delighted to have um, Graham Gillett back by popular demand. Uh, his session on, on Benjamin last week was... Uh, was, was extraordinary and he has a Everyone. in the world of architecture now. Um, I'm also delighted to be able to uh, welcome uh, Francesco Proto, who is the author of two books on architecture, uh, on, on Baudrillard architecture and is in many ways the world's authority on Baudrillard architecture. One stage, we almost, almost, he almost did a PhD with me a long time ago, um, but I'd moved from Notting of Nottingham to the AA in Bath by then. So today, um, uh, so this is, so this is, these are the two books by Francesco Proto. Um, uh, uh, I haven't read Baudrillard for Architects yet, um, but Mass Identity in Architecture is his initial, and based on his doctoral research um, on Baudrillard. Um, so today it's going to be, what's going to be, the, the order of the day is going to be, um, I'm going to say a few words first of all, um, followed by uh, Graham Gillard, um, talking more, general, more, more precisely about the kind of cultural aspects of Baudrillard. Um, and, and Francesca talking about Bodo and architecture. I'm not really talk about architecture so much as more about the cultural conditions, shall we say, in which architecture finds itself. And I think the question that we're going to be asking is really, is, is to what extent Baudrillard remains relevant? Um, he died in 2007. How, does he still remain relevant? I mean, just to say in terms of the whole, um, the, the, the schedule, um, we move on to Foucault next week. Uh, we, I'm delighted to have uh, Sanford Quinter there, who Sanford was studied under Foucault uh, in Paris. Um, Peter McCapio was there, will be there, and also Benaz Farahi. Um, so that should be a very special session. I want to point out whether the, the time changes because of the, the, the um, daylight savings in Europe. So it'll start at three o'clock um, European time. And then the following week, the 7th of, June, of, of November, um, when we have Michael Speaks, who, who studied under Frederick Jameson and Michael Hayes, um, the, the, the time change will be in China, it'll be 11 o'clock because of the, the, the American um, uh, change in clocks. And then we settle into a routine, although we're going to be thrown out um, later on. I, we, we're still juggling the end of the, 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 the schedules with the um, series. There might be some slight changes towards the end. Um, so... Um, <clears throat> Baudrillard. Um, I, I kind of like this photograph of Baudrillard and it, it shows him smoking a cigarette, very much a kind of unreconstructed, shall we say, Frenchman. Um, and he's very much a controversial figure in many ways, partly because of some of his comments that have outraged feminists around the world. He certainly outraged many Americans. Um, what is he? Is he, a, uh, is he a sociologist? Is he a philosopher? Is he a kind of provocateur? Uh, in many ways, he's all of these things. Um, and uh, but he, his his book uh, Simulacrum Simulation was voted. I noticed on on Amazon is is the top book in philosophy. So we can certainly include him, top selling book in philosophy in in our session today on uh, on on, on uh, philosophy. Um, <clears throat> the question, of course, is is uh, to what extent he remains relevant today. And I really want to sort of ask that question because you know he he uh, died he died in two thousand and seven before many of the uh, the kind of social media apps like Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, Twitter, and so on had uh, appeared on the scene. And many of the comments he was making um, back in the 80s and 90s were before even the internet and so on. And yet he managed in a very kind of prescient way to kind of talk about a, a culture that if anything has become more extreme. Um, I just meant that you, you would have noticed there a clip from, from the movie, The Matrix, and that's possibly what makes him very famous in the sense that uh, he, he, the, this was a book that uh, his book, Simulacrum and Simulation, was the kind of behind the matrix itself. So in many senses, I think Baudrillard, for all his kind of rather old-fashioned values in many ways, is, is very much a, a, a creature of our times in, who was in, in some senses very prescient um, about the world. We'll talk more about the matrix later. What I want to do today is to essentially to um, 
give some background, first of all, to where Baudrillard comes from in terms of the kind of cultural values of his time, and then talk about him and look at him basically through the lens of certain books and book titles that he did. What I'm going to give, give you is a little more than a kind of sketch of what Baudrillard is all about, uh, but hopefully to what, by the end of the session we'll have got into his work in much more detail. So let me start by um, mentioning Henri Lefebvre as a kind of, in terms of the cultural background. Uh, Henri Lefebvre was, was one was on, on his uh, a doctoral committee um, along with Roland Barthes and Pierre, Pierre Bourdieu, and that really situates him in a certain sort of culture. Uh, 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 Lefebvre was somebody who was in many ways um, part of a kind of phenomenological out outlook on, on life. He was critical about the obsession with, with ocular centrism, with a vision, and was interested in, in, in opening up um, our understanding of the world to the experience of the world. It was less a question of reading text than understanding, experiencing textures. And he has some very negative, critical comments to make about the architect who reduces the world to uh, blueprints. Um, and in many ways, this kind of this, this, this loss of lived experience in the way they see the world is a problem. As he mentions at the bottom, um, uh, after its fashion, um, the image kills. And I think this is kind of like in the way, the, way the, the, the context from which he's coming, not only that, but also um, the world of Roland Barthes um, uh, as, as somebody deeply steeped in that. But if there's anyone who really does kind of, in many ways, um, situate him or could be compared to his work, it's, it's Guy Debord, um, the uh, provocative French intellectual who was the author of this very famous book, The Society of the Spectacle, that came out in 1967. Um, and in many ways, the, the, the whole, I can't, unfortunately, I can't read this on the top here, uh, the, uh, the, the, the whole, the, the, um, uh, the, the point about uh, this book is really summed up in, um, in, in the, the initial sentence of the whole, the whole book. Um, not only sort of situating it in, in, the, in the kind of the conditions of capitalism, but also uh, pointing out that the, how the, all that was once lived has become mere representation. The notion of the spectacle doesn't refer to glasses as such, but more to a, a society of the spectacle, a society dominated by images in which we have somehow um, lost touch with the, with the sense of, of, of lived experience. Uh, and he was part of a group called the Situations International that was um, a, a group of radical artists and intellectuals who were, were challenging in many ways a number of things. Um, the, the, the obsession with, with the image, of course, the obsession with, with commodification. And in a time when, you know, before really television, before advertisements had really taken off, they could see already the problems of, of, of this particular world. I love my camera because I love to live. And not, not long after the publication of, of the Society of the Spectacle, um, there was this ast astonishing event in Paris, May 68, uh, an uprising among the students who were protesting about many things, um, not least these post-colonial kind of values in, in France, but also the commodification of everyday life. Um, and it was it was interesting because it many it spread through to the rest of France and there were wildcat strikes in many of the factories outside of Paris um, and it also all, almost led to the toppling of of, uh, of the government um, and what is interesting about this is the kind of is the way in which uh, the, this this radical way of thinking was 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 informed by by not only um, Debord's thinking but also uh, people like Lefebvre and so on underneath the pavias are, are the beach. And it was part also, one could say, of a, a kind of counter movement in the whole of 60s culture that found itself also in the States and the, the kind of protest against Vietnam, the kind of flower power protest, protest going on. Um, and one could also say, even in Eastern Europe, this is the, the uh, Prague uprising in the 60s. Um, it was very much part of a, of a kind of counter culture. This was a kind of very critical uh, approach towards um, towards the world. You can see maybe ramifications of it in, in the kind of work of people like Barbara Kruger later on, and also possibly in the world of kind of Occupy Wall Street, um, a kind of anti-capitalist uh, critique of society as a whole. What I find interesting, that I, I devote a chapter in my book, Anesthetics of Architecture, to this question, is by comparison how complacent architectural culture was at the time. This is the book Learning from Las Vegas that came out in 1972 that was extremely popular. I'm not quite sure why, it's a great title for sure, but it doesn't have much insight in terms of content. It is interesting to see the kind of the, the, the privileging of the celebration of the image, of the spectacle in, in this book, when you compare it to the kind of radical critique going on in France at the time. 
Um, and, and what is also interesting is the way that it aestheticizes all the kind of the, the issues of Las Vegas, of the gambling, the prostitution and so on. Um, it's simply offering a, a study of method, not content, but that itself, to my mind, is problematic in some senses. Um, most problematic of all, perhaps, is the image on the front cover uh, of a, a highly sexist um, uh, uh, advertisement for, for, um, for Suntan Ocean, for um, Tan Hawaiian with Tanya, where Tanya has been in many ways decontextualized, desemanticized, and recoded as mere kind of ornamentation. Um, and it was despite all this, that, that, and this of course was the kind of standard critique that the feminists would come up to with this kind of, uh, to this kind of world. Uh, in, in many, what is interesting about this is that not in the kind of the radical way they're criticizing it, this is an investment for, for aftershave. Um, instead of it, it makes me feel like a new man, it makes me feel like, a, like puking up, get your hands off our body. But it also it displays in some way how that society, the spectacle contains within itself, potentially some kind of self critique a kind of detournement of the, of the process itself. Um, and you could see this kind of, I would call it complacency, the superficiality, shall we say, extending to the architecture that um, uh, Venturi, Scott Brown and Eisenhower produced. This is a National Gallery extension in London, this uh, supposedly witty reference to these different classical sort of styles. Uh, and you can see also in the interior of the staircase here, what is kind of a, a, an interesting feature, if you look at these kind of what seem to be uh, kind of the re references to the uh, the, the cast iron, uh, the, the, the railway architecture, the vaults of the railway stations in London, these seem to be a reference to that. But when you notice that these are sitting over windows, you realize they're not structural at all. And in fact, you can see a shadow line between them. These are simply added as a form of ornamentation. So without getting into in too much detail, I think we can see a radical contrast um, between the kind of what was going on in architecture and really what was going on in kind of critical uh, intellectual circles in France at the time. So, um, Jean Baudrillard, um, what I want to do today is to really try and um, sketch out some um, a, a kind of overview of Baudrillard, uh, of some of the kind of key ideas without going into too much detail. And I want to do it through the medium of books or book covers and some of the, the thoughts, some of the kind of key strategies that themselves are contained within the title of, this, of these book covers. This book, Fatal Strategy, is, uh, is um, uh, I won't go into the, into the details of the book itself, but the term Fatal Strategies was, was something that was adopted. It was a strategy adopted by Baudrillard. In many ways, when he was arguing something, he would argue something in an extreme degree. In other words, it was he would exaggerate his point in order to get his get his message across. It was what he was offering was less a, a representation of, of reality than a transcendence of reality. And many of the titles, such as uh, the Gulf War did not take place, of course, were outrageous and are seen in that way. But at the same time, this was a way of making, making his point. Another title of a book was The Ecstasy of Communication. And what I find astonishing about this is the way in which he could see the kind of way in which we were kind of overloaded in information society by communication, um, by information. This information overload actually didn't lead to a society of information, but a society in which somehow information was devouring itself. It led to a kind of a, a, a society in a way bombarded by information, but with no information, a kind of society, a proliferation of consumerist images um, empty of content. And that, of course, was, this was written in 1987, way before the internet really took off, way before uh, mobile phones, cell phones appeared, way before the kind of the world of Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, and Twitter. And yet he could sort of see what was happening. And in some senses, his message, therefore, is even more important today, it would seem. One of the key themes in Baudrillard's work is, um, work is how we are detached, as it were, from reality. Um, the perfect crime really is a story about the, the, the perfect crime of the 20th century, the theft of reality itself. And much of this is to do with the way that the world has become aestheticized. We mentioned the term aestheticization last week in the context of Walter Benjamin. And really in Baudrillard, it takes on um, a more radical turn in many ways, less dialectical in some senses. But the point here is that once art becomes penetrates everything, the world is completely um, um, uh, aestheticized. The world, it is completely kind of rendered um, uh, in a, some ways stripped or rinsed of its kind of social and political and, and economic kind of concerns. And you could see this also in the way that somehow the art world um, 
it becomes everything becomes art you get to a situation whereby what you don't know what art is it leads to a kind of breakdown of definitions of all these things um and indeed you could look at this in many different sort of ways uh, it's not just the question of aesthetics it's also other things when everything becomes historical nothing is historical anymore when everything becomes political nothing is political anymore and likewise when everything becomes aesthetic nothing is aesthetic anymore we live in a trans-historical trans-political and trans-aesthetic world as each category grows swollen, swollen and distended, a condition of obesity exists and the contents are obliterated. Everything has been Xeroxized into an infinity. In this ecstasy of communication, this society of saturation, events have been lost in the void of information, deprived of all meaning. This is a comment from my book, um, uh, Millennium Culture, that came out the same year as The Anesthetics of Architecture, both books really focusing on, on Baudrillard's thinking. <clears throat> But perhaps the most pro um, provocative book was a uh, um, was this one um, written um, just after the Gulf Gulf War. Well, actually, it was written in three stages. What the it was based on an article that was published. Uh, well, initially, first in the Guardian and in Libération in France. Um, the Gulf War will not take place, which was written before the Gulf War itself took place. And then there was a second article: the Gulf War is not taking place, that was written during the during the the the, 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 the Gulf War itself. And finally. A third essay, The Gulf War Did Not Take Place, which was written after the Gulf War. Uh, and without going into Baudrillard's particular reasons about this, about this kind of culture of simulation in which, in which this war um, was in some ways acted out, it's fair to say that it happened in, in, as, in, as far as a, a Western media audience uh, was concerned, as a kind of a media event, a televised media event. There were other events happening at the same time, such as the genocide in East Timor, that we knew nothing about because it didn't become a media event. And yet both were about oil. One was about protecting, well, they were both about protecting interests in oil. It was, it was inconvenient to mention East Timor because there was a time, um, a, an agreement between the Australian government and Indonesia to exploit the extraction of oil. But is it, I think precisely this kind of question of aestheticization also creeps into this. Aestheticization, not only in terms of the, of the individuals who were kind of executing that war, who were in some ways abstracted from that sort of world in sense um, uh, and, and brought up maybe on space invaders machines so in some senses or games like that in some senses it was it was kind of seen in that abstracted way but also in terms of an, an aestheticization um, that Bernard Schulli refers to in one of his um, famous articles a general form of aestheticization has indeed taken place conveyed by the media just as stealth bombers are aestheticized on the, the televised Saudi Arabian sunset, just as sex is aestheticized in advertising. So all of culture, and of course, this includes architecture, is now aestheticized, xeroxized. Furthermore, the simultaneous presentation of these images leads to reduction of history to simultaneous images, not only those of the Gulf War interspersed with basketball matches and advertisements, but also those of our architectural magazines and ultimately those of our cities. And I'm referring here not just simply to the kind of glossy magazine culture that we have in architectural culture, but also to some extent the kind of escapist culture of wallpaper in which somehow architecture is itself co-opted. Um, Bernard Schumi, I'd say, is really was at the center of all these things. He was kind of brought up in Paris during the, he was educated in Paris during the 60s, and this was really very much part of his theoretical agenda at the time. And this is an image that I showed you last week about the Gulf War. That, that is can very easily be written, be read as a kind of fireworks display. But what actually we're seeing are, are, the, mis, are the, the, the instruments of war, missiles, rockets, anti-aircraft, uh, but seen through this lens, the kind of the eerie green of the night, uh, of the night sights, one can aestheticize this and see this as a, a dramatic kind of spectacle and rinse it of all the horror that is associated with it. This is precisely in some senses, the problem of aestheticization. Seduction was a kind of, and also a kind of a, a famous book in many ways, um, and a somewhat controversial book. Um, what Baudrillard means here by seduction is not sexual seductions, uh, although sexual seduction is somehow annexed in some way within this kind of this 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 scheme. He's more interested in the kind of two modalities of, of engagement that we have in our contemporary age, the difference, as it were, between interpretation and seduction. Seduction is being, about being caught within the surface of the surface images. Interpretation is about rupturing those surface images and digging deeper, looking for some underlying meaning. For Baudrillard, it's, it, uh, it's clear that seduction has won. Seduction is, has, has triumphed over interpretation. We live in a world of seductive kind of images. 
And alongside that, there's also some kind of critique of a kind of capitalism itself in the sense that the notion of seduction was very different from early notions of seduction. He refers to ideas of courtly love where seduction was much more kind of meaningful. Whereas for, for Baudrillard, it was all about somehow this kind of the obscene pornographic logic of the striptease, so the striptease making things absolutely obvious and, and blatant in some senses, of which pornography would be a prime example. But when one thinks about the kind of culture of advertising and the way in which the kind of culture of seduction triumphs, it's kind of many, in many ways, you can see what Baudrillard is getting at. Um, in the old days, when I was a kid, you'd get people on television coming on and uh, in an advertisement and, and trying to argue why a particular toothpaste or a particular washing powder made sense. Now it's just about one particular kind of image with a label and a kind of dream space, less about content and more about um, <clears throat> more about the kind of just the simply this uh, a kind of almost a dream image to dream yourself into uh, Prada, Gucci, um, uh, Dolce and Gabbana and so on. This is the some in many ways the culture <clears throat> of advertising today. And I was thinking also that in many ways, what we were talking about last week in terms of Benjamin and Krakow, in the way in which somehow there's a kind of magical tinge to the way we operate things or a mythical tinge to things. Um, there was an argument made by Andrew Wernick, who says that basically it's not just a culture of the image, it's a culture of the promotional image of branding and so on, which I completely agree with. But I think it goes beyond that. It become, it's become the dream image or the wish image. You wear some shoes, some Puma shoes and you get to... Um, to, to, to run as fast as Usain Bolt, you wear some Adidas um, uh, 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 um, sportswear and you get to play soccer, football, as well as David Beckham. And it's also, of course, a deeply sexist one, the kind of the images of Tanya Wayne and Tanya are kind of are, are, are summoned up here in the way that the female body is appropriated in this culture of, of advertising. Um, no doubt it's for those people who want to buy a BMW, they dream of having someone like Gigi Hadid uh, climbing into the car with them. It's a, it's a deeply kind of uncritical, sexist, superficial world, but at the same time, it is the world that is triumphed today. We live in a world of seduction. And this one, this this particular book in many ways reminded me of of, um, of, of that in some sense. This was a, a, a book put together by Rem Kornhaus after his uh, curatorship of the Venice Biennale. Every single room in one of the pavilions there had a, a book written about it. And then in the end, there was this massive book that was put out there which to my mind was a complete kind of heroic failure, shall we say, a uh, heroic failure uh, that actually, um, in a sense, we live in a kind of soundbite culture, a, cu a culture of likes and dislikes where we don't get engaged in any way, a culture more like Bjork Ingels than the culture of Rem Kohlhaas. Um, but that is the culture in many ways in which we live today. Perhaps the most um, infuriating book in some senses um, was this book that Baudrillard wrote about America. Um, he took a, a kind of road trip around America um, and uh, like many of the kind of several Europeans before him to Tocqueville, also Umberto Eco, somewhat disparaging about life in America. There were, of course, others such as Rainer Bannon who were completely enthralled by America, but Baudrillard in this road trip it by the desert as a kind of cultural desert. Um, and he makes a number of observations about that, the, the, the kind of culture of disappearance, the disappearance of all culture. Um, and not only was America for him, um, a, a, and he outraged feminists as, as well in some of the comments he was making about the desert, but it was not only just a culture, a, a, America was not a culture with, was not only without any culture, it was also without any identity. But as he puts it, they do have wonderful teeth. Um, and it was in the it was it was America itself that in many ways opens up some of these kind of important questions that Baudrillard deals with um, this idea that somehow Las Vegas when it uh, when it rises uh, it, when it, uh, dark, uh, at the night time it plunges us into this stupefied hyper real euphoria that we would not exchange for anything else and that is the empty and inescapable form of seduction in the end Baudrillard is of course seduced by seduction himself even though he is in some sense critiquing it. This was a comment that was made in Simulacra and Simulation, in many ways his most famous book, um, for a number of reasons. I will outline just simply two today. Um, one of them was, is, is the fact that he introduces the term hyperreality into this, into this in the context of, um, of his thinking. Hyperreality is, in some sense, is a, a term that goes beyond Debord. I once heard Baudrillard in a lecture and somebody asked in the audience, 
your thinking reminds me of the, of the work of Guy de Boer, which was a kind of naive question, but actually his answer was very useful. And Baudrillard said, yes, well, when de Boer was writing in the 60s, I completely agreed with him. Um, but now we've entered into a further stage, the third order of simulation, where it's not simply a question of us um, having sort of the, the things being lost behind the culture of the image, the image has become our culture now. We are completely marooned in what he called hyperreality, a culture of images in which we have no reference in the real world itself. Uh, we've lost touch with reality, reality has been stolen. And he uses the example of Disney lanterns to illustrate this particular um, context. Um, what Baudrillard argues is that uh, that is that Disneyland presents itself as though it's an imaginary escape, escapist kingdom where you escape from the kind of cultural values of America. Um, not so. According to Baudrillard, uh, the Disneyland is precisely a condensation of all of those values. It is essentially, it is America. Um, from the moment you park in the, in, in the car park, the moment you take your last, I don't know, milkshake, you are basically spending money, you are contributing towards Disney, um, uh, uh, Disney PLC. But the point that Baudrillard makes is that Disneyland, in pretending to be a kind of culture that is um, a, 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 an, an imaginary world, becomes a prop to the world outside. It makes us believe that the world outside is, 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 is real. In Disneyland is supposedly imaginary, the world outside is real, but of course both are precisely part of, the, of, the, of, the, of, of, of a hyper-real culture. They're both entrapped with that and if Disneyland is no different to the world outside, then the world outside is no different to Disneyland. I was particularly struck by this advertisement that came out a long time ago. You can see Concorde flying in the, in the top there, uh, where it showed Disneyland on the right-hand side uh, and put it alongside you know, uh, not only Versailles and Fontainebleau, but also the kind of monuments of, of Paris. It struck me as an absurd thing that the culture that had given us um, uh, the, the, the Chateau of the Loire was going to be cele celebrating a fake chateau in Disneyland. It seemed also extraordinary that somehow Disneyland was equated with the uh, Arc de Triomphe, with, with the Eiffel Tower, with Notre Dame and so on. But when you think about it, actually, really what happens is that the whole of Paris itself has been appropriated as a form of Disneyland, as a form of kind of theme park. And these, uh, these monuments are themselves kind of wrapped up in, in this kind of culture of hyper-reality. Not only the, the Eiffel Tower, the Arc de Triomphe, the Notre Dame, but also Versailles, Fontainebleau, and all those other cultural monuments. Monuments uh, they can become part of this whole thing. And not only that, but also one could say the rest of, let's say, the cultural heritage of, of Europe. Venice, precisely, is a form of theme park, a form of Disneyland, and likewise places like the Bauhaus. They become a kind of thematized uh, um, Disneyland. And here you can kind of see this in some senses. Um, the, the kind of you, you go to the Chateau on the Loire and you go for your Le Weekend and you go and have Le pic Picnic in the garden there and you enjoy this kind of spectacle, but you enjoy it rinsing it all, of all the kind of the, the reality of what it was, what it came from. And I don't know where the money came to build this, whether it came from, from, from the slave trade or whatever. It's all kind of decontextualized into this escapist kind of wallpaper domain um, where we are somehow removed from reality and, and, and in this kind of hyper real condition. Roll up, roll up for the hyperreal coach tour of Europe. And in many ways also we can see relationships or comparisons or points of, of inter intersection between the theme of hyperreality and the theme of virtual reality. And I'll maybe say a few words about that later. So, but but what, what is Baudrillard perhaps most famous for um, is the, the fact that the, the movie The Matrix was supposedly based on, uh, on simulacrum simulation. Apparently the actors were asked to uh, be involved in, uh, to, to read a, a, a copy of this. And in the, in the movie itself, as you can see, Simulacrum Simulation plays a, a kind of a role. Um, indeed, Baudrillard himself was uh, invited to, um, to be part of the sequel um, to, to, the, to, to, to The Matrix. But for him, it was really, it was a travesty. They misunderstood um, the condition in which we find him and find ourselves. Um, according to one review of this uh, I read, um, uh, Baudrillard, Baudrillard takes the view that really the problem about the matrix is it assumes that we can step out of this condition, out of this kind of sim sim cultural simulation uh, and, and see the world as it is, in some ways a bit like 
the story of, of Plato's cave, whereby philosophy allows us to emerge from this kind of simulacra, this culture of, 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 of shadows or representations to see the world as it is. But according to Baudrillard, we're absolutely completely trapped in it. There is no escape. We are marooned in this kind of hyperspace of hyperreality, and there's no way out. So Baudrillard was, was very highly dismissive of the movie and didn't take part in any way in the sequel itself. So let me just finally sum up with a kind of few a few comments um, uh, about what, what are the, in some ways, senses, the, the limitations of Baudrillard's thinking. I mean, I think that his, his, his thinking is, is highly provocative, highly radical, and highly, highly thought-provoking, albeit problematic for all the reasons that I've outlined in terms of his kind of his, his views on, on the way in which he uh, upset certain people, especially his very misogynistic sort of views. But nonetheless, I think he has an important role to play in, as, as a provocateur in opening up these kind of questions. But you have to ask certain, 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 you have to challenge him in many ways. I mean, when was this moment when we were in touch with reality? If we see this kind of progression, when we move from a world in which we are in touch with reality to a world, let's say, of the spectacle, the society of the spectacle, to the world of the third order simulations, when we completely lost touch with reality, when was this moment, this kind of original kind of paradise in some senses, when we were in touch with reality? When was this moment when we were free of any kind of, um, uh, 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 any questions of, 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 of problematic issues of gender, of racism, of slavery, or of, 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 of whatever else? I mean, the point is, there was no such time. There was no sort of golden age in the past, it seemed to me. Also, we can sort of begin to sort of see this in the context of other <clears throat> critiques in some senses. Um, in many ways, uh, the work of, Bo of, of Slavoj Žižek is kind of interesting, especially in the context of, of, of virtual reality. Um, in an essay he wrote on, on, on virtual reality, it was just called From Virtual Reality to the Virtualization of Reality. He points out in many ways that reality is already, always already virtualized for, 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 for Žižek. Um, uh, the world outside comes to us through the maze of the imagination, through a detour of the maze of the imagination. And fantasy, far from being seen in opposition to reality, is precisely a lens by which we look at reality. In other words, we fantasize about reality itself. And this leads into the conclusion that uh, what virtual reality teaches us is not how virtual virtual reality is, but rather how virtual reality itself is. Let me say that one more time. What virtual reality teaches us is not how virtual virtual reality is, but rather how virtual reality itself is. We never have access to reality if you take the kind of Lacanian perspective, perspective that Zizek buys into. Equally, one can look at the, this recent book that came out in the States by last, this last week by Anil Seth, Being You, from a neuroscientific point of view, where the people are thinking about how we already have, as, as it were, a model of the world in our brain, and, we, and the brain has to offer certain predictions about what is happening out there. The brain is kind of locked into this kind of bony skull with only having these kind of vague electrical impulses, as it were, coming from the outside, and we have to guess what's out there. In other words, it's a form of predictive perception, or in, in Anil Seth's term, it's a form of controlled hallucination. We don't engage with the real. So these up in many ways kind of a challenge in some senses, uh, what Baudrillard is saying. That, that it's not just, well, on the one hand, you could see them as kind of reinforcing it. We are removed from reality. But the point is, these are, are arguing that we will never engage directly with reality. It's always a kind of mediated interaction with reality itself. <clears throat> then there is this question about the photographs. Um, what is interesting about Baudrillard um, is that, and I went to an exhibition of his photographs once in, in Leicester in, in England. Um, is that for someone who was so critical about the world of the image, it's remarkable how interested he was in photography. He published a book on photographs and he, um, as I mentioned, had several exhibitions of photographs. Um, one is left with a suspicion that there is a kind of, at the heart of Baudrillard's project, a kind of repressed fascination with the world of the image. Um, far from being critical about it, he's somehow seduced by it. Um, and in some senses, one can see that through the logic of the standard critique, for example, of, of homophobia. If you think about the, the movie American Beauty, where the father who comes across as deeply homophobic towards the end of the film, we discover that he's kind of gay. The, the standard critique of homophobia is, is that people who, 
might suspect they might they might be gay they, they were in denial and therefore they project it onto someone else and they criticize it and so on it seems to me that the logic of repressed fascination is a fascinating one and i've certainly i've noticed that it seems to apply to baudrillard as much as it applies to people like paul virilio they seem to be attacking something but at the same time there is such an obs <clears throat> an obsession with it is that it's a, as though there is a kind of repressed fascination with it so what are we left with about baudrillard this was a recent uh, exhibition um in, in Shanghai of, of Baudrillard's photography, it seems that somehow he himself has been completely appropriated by the culture of hyperreality, the culture of the image that he was attacking so much, and maybe with which in which he was himself somehow in love. I want to finish my particular kind of um, with my presentation with just a, a final the final comment that that came out of um, my book, The Anesthetics of Architecture, which was a uh, highly provocative um, comment in some sense that, kind of, that turned the whole argument on its head. Could it be then that Baudrillard himself is the unwitting victim of his own prognosis, prognosis and, then, and that in the hyper-real world of the image, philosophy itself has become aestheticized as the ultimate icon of hyper-real culture, more especially within an architectural culture of depthless, seductive images and shimmering effects, philosophy always threatens to be appropriated as an intellectual veneer a surface gloss. I mean, I say that because at the time I'd been to some sort of re reviews at the Architectural Association, where it was quite trendy for people at the time to quote Derrida or to quote Deleuze as a way of adding a certain sort of veneer to that uh, the, to, to, to their work. Um, in such a context, what is philosophy but a mere fashion accessory? And I think this points towards potentially one of the real problems about postmodernity, which is kind of it, the, even opposition to the post to, to, to that kind of culture itself somehow gets co-opted um, so that resistance it devours its own kind of resistance and we'll see that when we come to the work of, uh, of, um, uh, of also Frederick Jameson who seems to kind of follow it there's a similar idea in his work so um, we've not we've got two more presentations I'm going to finish my up mine now um, before we, we have invite uh, Francesco to come talk about architecture, where he'll be engaging directly with Baudrillard's um, discussion about architecture, I want to invite um, Graham to say um, a, a few words. I've got a few slides up here. Um, so, um, Graham, it's, it's wonderful to see you again. Um, thank you so much. Um, you have a fan club here in the architectural culture. Um, thank, thanks so much, Neil, and thanks for, thanks for inviting me back uh, for some comments, uh, to, to, to make some comments on uh, Baudrillard this week. Um, yeah, and, and I th thank you for that for that really wonderful uh, presentation and introduction to Baudrillard's work. I'm, I'm always amazed how you managed to bring in so many uh, ideas and cover so much ground in, in what was that, 20, 25 minutes, something like that. It was really wonderful. So thank you so much for that. I'm, and I'm not, my slides are going to, a super stripped back minimalist uh, affairs compared with uh, the wonderful ones that you've been presenting. But I just wanted to pick up, so I, this, this is going to be very short. Um, and I just wanted to pick up on a, a couple of things that you said and, and a term that I know is a, is, a, is a favorite of yours. And I think, first of all, I just wanted to say that I think you're absolutely right about Baudrillard and this notion of fascination. And I think this comes across uh, continually in his work, this sense of both being drawn and attracted to something and repulsed and repelled by it at the same time. And I think this really comes across most clearly, perhaps in his work, precisely on America, where he is, uh, this word fascination, I think is a really good way of capturing his complete preoccupation and interest um, with this uh, culture of surfaces and the superficial, this, this uh, a culture that is um, talks about depthlessness, and again, this notion of the, the desert of culture and all these kinds of terms that he uses, and and yet at the same time, then he spins this around and and turns this into a critique of French culture and European culture as well as uh, one that is pompous, pretentious, preoccupied with its supposed history, its its glorious traditions, uh, its uh, ancestry, and uh, uh, antiquaries, etc. So Baudrillard kind of spins these things around uh, continually um, and is uh, wonderful at unseating our preoccupations and unsettling the reader, I think. Just when you think 
um, that you've kind of grasped what Baudrillard has to say, he suddenly turns it around uh, in surprising ways and challenges you and upsets precisely uh, your own reading of uh, of his work. So I love this uh, contrast that you made between interpretation and seduction. Baudrillard for me is a very seductive reader and his, his, um, his provocation is always to overturn our interpretation of his work. Just when you thought you've grasped what he has to say, um, that we, we find out actually it slips between or slips through our fingers. I, when I, when I um, talk to my own students about how to read Baudrillard, I, I say you have to read Baudrillard at least twice. I mean, hopefully we will read him many times, but at least twice. And the first time I want you to read him and I want you to think that he believes every word that he's written. Um, and the second time I want you to read it again, and I want you to think that Baudrillard actually doesn't believe a single thing that he's written. And I think holding those two readings at the same time in your head, uh, that he means what he says, and that he's playing a game and doesn't mean a single thing he says, that's the way I think you have to try and read Baudrillard and kind of hop from one foot to another because we are continually being wrong-footed in our reading of Baudrillard. So as I said, my slides are super minimalist, just a sort of series of words just to, just to help me uh, remember the, something that I wanted you to, to say. So I'm going to take this title on some mid-chiefs in uh, Baudrillard as a little nod to last week uh, and Benjamin, some, some motifs in Baudelaire. I'm not going to draw parallels or correspondences between the two, but rather I'm just going to take a, a term that I know, Neil, you mentioned last week, that is kind of one of your favourite and sort of key concepts. We move on to the next slide, which is the notion of uh, mimesis or mimesis. And I think this term is a kind of actually perhaps a perhaps surprisingly key term that sits in the background of a way of thinking about or reading Baudrillard. Um, and I think this notion of mimesis, imitation, copying, um, may help us really to, to, sort of, to understand certain aspects of Baudrillard's work. And I'm going to use it as a sort of key term, and I'm going to sort of uh, move out from this idea of mimesis in, in two ways. The first is that it brings to mind for me um, one uh, particular favourite text by Baudrillard, um, which is a short essay he wrote, Please Follow Me, uh, back in the 80s, um, in response to a photographic exhibition by uh, Sophie Cow, the um, French conceptual artist, um, and her work, Sweet Benetienne, which is uh, it's a, it's a very simple, very, very uh, beautifully realized photographic project in which Sophie Cow, based in Paris, meets someone at a party one evening, discovers that they're going to uh, Venice the next day, and decides to follow them, um, and then travels to precisely to uh, Venice, finds out where they are staying, and starts to follow them around the city, uh, taking photographs of them, taking photographs of their, uh, the things that they photograph, etc. So there's a kind of form of shadowing ensues in which Sophie Cowell is led through the city, um, not through uh, expressly, she says expressly, not because she has any particular interest in this figure, but simply because she's interested in the idea of being led through a space that someone else is setting the agenda, if you like, someone else, uh, someone else has a, a, a mapping or a, a destination, which she merely follows, uh, which she does not herself know. And I think this, uh, this notion of following is kind of, uh, is a form of Mimesis, it's about copying, it's about shadowing, it's about copying a trajectory, it's about copying someone's route at a distance. And I think this is a very, for me, this uh, is a very playful project. Um, it's a precisely about being uh, drawn by appearances, about drawn by signs, 
images and representations. And it is for me a kind of perfect representation of this word seduction. Uh, the word seduction, of course, is from uh, seducere, being to be led astray. And this is precisely what Sophie Cowell is. She is led astray in following this figure around uh, the, the city of Venice. Um, we, can, we can talk at length about the notions of the labyrinthine here. We could talk about other kinds of references to other um, experiences of Venice and its presentation as a labyrinth in films like Nicholas Rogue's Don't Look Now from 1973, for instance. But what I'm interested in here is, is this idea then of seduction as a game, as a, as a, as a playfulness, which and I think this goes back to, as you were saying, Neil, uh, the notion of uh, living in a society of spectacle where we are in many ways seduced, but by seducing a banal, obvious, um, explicit, Baudrillard would use the term obscene way, where his interest is in a different kind of notion of seduction. Seduction, which is about playfulness, it's about intrigue, it's about mystery, it is about the hidden, it is about the unexplained. It is that which is not um, explicit at all. We never really find out why Sophie Cal uh, follows this figure, for instance. It's not, uh, there's no sort of banal, uh, obvious reason for this project to come into being. And yet we as readers, we become seduced by this project as well, because we, uh, through reading and looking at the images, we follow Sophie Cal as she follows Henri B, the figure that she follows, um, through the city. So here we see one act of seduction leading to another act of seduction. In other words, seduction starts to multiply itself. If we move on near to the next slide. And this notion then of mimesis then um, is a sort of second meaning, not only this sort of notion of copying, physically copying, as an embodied copying, as in the case of uh, the seduced uh, pursuant in the city or pursuer in the city. But also my is then as much more familiar perhaps as notions of representation, um, of mirror, mirroring, of multiplication, of the copying and mimicking of something. And this comes, uh, this is, I think is really, this idea then is really very much at the heart of Baudrillardian writing and thinking. And we see continually the use of terms, which sort of uh, attempts to capture this process of reproduction, so dualities. So he endlessly talks about things like twins, he talks about doppelganger, he talks about shadows, uh, he talks about cloning, for instance. Moving on from sort of Benjamin's notion of the work of art in the age of its technological reproducibility, um, Baudrillard is uh, preoccupied with this notion of the uh, multiplication of things ad infinitum. And of course, he's interested precisely then in how these reproductions themselves serve as substitutes for, as models for, and as simulations of the real, that the real is then subject to this massive process of multiplication um, and representation such that we move to this process by which the simulation itself, the model, the staging, the reconstruction, the reenactment of the real actually starts to become, uh, take precedence over the real, that we prefer it, we like it better than uh, the real. Um, and in actual fact, then that the model itself starts to, uh, be uh, the standard, if you like, which the real then starts to copy, that the real itself becomes a copy of these stimulations. I always use the example here of something like a, an Ikea showroom where you walk in and then you are confronted by not objects in series, as Baudrillard would say, you know, here's, here's a set of chairs that you could buy, choose one, here's a set of tables, 
that you could buy, choose one of these, here's a set of wardrobes, cupboards, whatever it may be. No, what we're confronted with is a series of models. Here is a living room. Here is a bedroom. Here is a child's room. Here is a dining room, um, which uh, become models become representations which we then uh, spend our time buying these elements buying these bits of furniture so that we can recreate them in our own home those ikea showrooms uh, precisely the models which we start to reconstruct our own domestic spaces uh, in line with of course you know unfortunately our own domestic spaces are probably never as good as the IKEA showrooms. We were, we were kind of envious that these uh, these models are, in actual fact, better than the realities that we can construct. Um, and when you think about it, think about uh, the, these sort of uh, faked environments, these simulations. And I think the IKEA uh, showroom space is a really interesting example. When when you look and there's a there's a kind of workroom and they actually have a sort of like you know plastic. A desktop computer with a sort of plastic keyboard there and think about think about who's actually manufacturing these things and this is that companies are producing these elements to form parts of these simulations and models what a sort of strange world that is of producing for precisely these purposes of reconstructing uh, these uh, creating these constructed environments for us to visit and then copy our own domestic spaces. So if we move on again, Neil, please. Um, and this kind of notion, this construction, particularly these kind of binaries, the Crunchy, the twins, the idea of the doppelganger, produce the possibilities, I think, of some really, uh, what I always sort of see as a, sort of one of the great strengths of Baudrillard's work, the notions of reversal uh, that take place. A couple of examples of this, Neil, you've already mentioned one of them, is that idea that the proliferation of media communications, the more and more information that is there, the more and more uh, channels and platforms that we have to communicate, actually, this produces not a sort of super, uh, not a sort of super abundance of meaningful communication, but rather quite the opposite. The more communication there is, the less meaning is being produce the more information we have the less informed we are uh, the more data we have the less wise we become so this on the one hand proliferation produces uh, precisely the opposite the diminution of uh, meaning and meaningful communication and so this kind of this kind of reversal i think is a kind of key aspect of Baudrillard's work. And one, ex one uh, other example of this, my favorite example of this is um, and his work uh, on uh, the mass and the, the notion of the silent, so-called silent majorities. Baudrillard says that, you know, historically, the powerful, the elites, uh, those who have ruled and governed have always sought to exclude the masses, the majorities from decision-making, to exclude them from uh, participation within politics, to exclude their voice, to keep them outside, if you like, and at a distance. But um, this has changed towards the end of the 20th century and into the 21st century. Now it's a sort of desperate sense that there's a, of a detachment of the masses, the silent majorities. They've become too silent. They have actually withdrawn their interests, they have become bored, they have become apathetic, they are no longer interested in politics. They're much more interested in advertising and sport and spectacle and music, um, uh, social media. And as a result, there's a kind of withdrawal from politics. And now we see the demand from our politicians to get out the vote to uh, engage people, to communicate, to mobilize people, that we must go out and do our democratic duty to vote. We're too bored to vote. We're too uh, disinterested to vote. But suddenly now there's a desperation to bring the masses back in because they see uh, uh, voter numbers declining. And so there's a sort of a, a, a peculiar reversal suddenly now is the, the threat not of the participation of the masses, but their mass non-participation and the resulting withdrawal of legitimacy from the whole process of democratic politics. 
so-called democratic politics. Can we move on, Neil, please? And I think this, this notion of withdrawal uh, and, and reversal is best captured, and this is uh, from a simula <laughs> simulation, um, precisely in relation to Disneyland, where um, there's this, which is one of my favorite quotes from, uh, from Baudrillard's work, which is this idea of the deterrence machine. And that Disneyland is, uh, he says, neither true nor false, but he says it's a deterrence machine to set up the idea that, that we can go there. And while we're there, we can be childish, we can be playful, we don't need to take the world seriously. Um, and that, that space then becomes one where we can be infantilized, he says. Precisely so that uh, to foster the illusion, he says, that outside that space, when we leave Disneyland, then we're returning to the real world outside, the real world where we re return to being adult again. And he says, that, so what the, the Disneyland does is to function as a deterrence machine to deter us from actually recognizing, to uh, create the illusion in actual fact that the outside world is the world of adults, where in actual fact, he says, um, it is precisely a world of childishness as well. And in his notion of a deterrence machine, it's a really interesting uh, idea. And I think if we move on uh, to the last slide, please, Neil. And I think that one way of thinking today about how Baudrillard is relevant is that, that perhaps today we live in a world, a networked world, a sort of um, a rhizomic world of deterrence machines of various kinds. I've used a term here, alibis. Alibis, uh, the word alibi uh, literally means, um, of course, um, elsewhere. Um, and that in, the deterrence machine is precisely about creating the illusion that something is happening elsewhere that is real in some way. And perhaps this is how we can start to think about certain other aspects of the world, not just Disney World as a sort of deterrence machine, creating the illusion of an adult life outside. But perhaps we can understand the sort of childishness of certain politics and political actors that we have seen recently and continue to see. The childishness and uh, stupidities and foolishness of the idiocies of politics creates the illusion that there is a real or serious politics somewhere else going on. Um, and that this is, this is a distraction. This is not real politics. Real politics happens elsewhere, outside. Similarly with the kind of the notion of the, the economy, the notion that the economy is in crisis. Um, this is also a kind of deterrence machine uh, because it creates the illusion that in actual fact, business as usual, as I put it here, is not a crisis when surely capitalism is the crisis. It sort of goes back to uh, sort of Benjamin's uh, ideas when, when he says kind of, you know, that the, the, the catastrophe, the pro pro notion of progress is the catastrophe in actual fact. And of course, this idea that the state of exception, what appears to be extraordinary, the notion of crisis, the notion of childish politics, the spaces of Disney World, these appear to be the exceptional spaces, the odd ones out, the spaces that are different, when in actual fact, the exceptional is in actual fact now the norm. And I was just thinking that perhaps this is one way we could start thinking about why uh, dystopias have a certain voguish popularity at the moment. I was at a conference uh, earlier in the year about why the term utopia seems to have disappeared almost as, as, as a way of thinking or a way of talking and why dystopias proliferate on our screens and in, in text, in, in our imaginations all the time. We are surrounded by dystopian thinking. And one way of thinking about that is as a kind of warning about the direction we may be heading in or uh, the trajectories of our society today, what could be. Well, perhaps there's another way of thinking about the work of the dystopian imagination. And that is as a kind of also as a kind of deterrence machine, which seems to tell us that the dystopia is elsewhere. 
when perhaps what Baudrillard is telling us is that instead of that, the, uh, the dystopia is actually here and now and with us and all around us. And on that note, I will stop. Thanks very much, Neil, for uh, uh, giving me some time to share some thoughts with you. And I hope that was uh, that was that was terrific, Graham. I I mean, I, I always when you talk, it's funny because we were talking about the deck builder last last week and about how Benjamin would have this image that would open up worlds. You almost work the other way around. I think there isn't an expression "build Denker," where you can you can just your your description of taking a strand around IKEA was really a, a you have a beautiful way of describing things. That was that was that was beautiful. That was beautiful. Um, I, let's move straight on to Francesco. I mean, I I, I just want one final thing. I think there was I, I I always think that Graham that in, from British culture they always have we always have these kind of like these disasters going on. These kind of like uh, soap operas that EastEnders and things, and it's almost like you know. You can't complain, can't complain. It's almost like making us feel like well, life isn't so bad in our real lives. But that was beautiful. You teased out a lot of very interesting ideas. So let's move on to Francesco. Um, Francesco, would you like to uh, share your screen? Um, just if you want to know for the beginning, Francesco is, of course, the author of two books on Baudrillard and architecture. Um, He's currently uh, on sabbatical, but he's teaching at uh, Oxford Brookes University in the UK. He comes from Italy, and I'm still perplexed as to why an Italian would want to go exchange um, uh, Italian food, Italian culture, and Italian weather for the British one. But uh, welcome, Francesco. Hello, Neil. Uh, well, the, the 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 answer is pretty straightforward because of you, because at the time you were the only one uh, launching a program in the UK including the words Jean Baudrillard. And therefore, I decided as a student, as soon as I got my degree in architecture in Rome, to move to England to become a Baudrillard scholar. And actually, I didn't know that this program was entailing the relationship between architecture and critical theory, and I didn't know much about critical theory. I was just very much embedded within Baudrillard's um, writings at the time. As a student, I still am, actually. I was seduced by Baudrillard writings and these very seductive way of conveying his ideas. And therefore, I joined the master program first and then the PhD, as you correctly say before. And then after that, I also became a, a critical theorist myself. Um, now, a few remarks about, about this. So thank you so much for, for what you launched in the past. Uh, it's still very much present uh, through also my contribution to Baudrillard scholarship. Also, thank you for your presentation and Graham, because the the, the, the there's some important remarks I would like to do. Actually, that would be more than sufficient to start our debate, but I'll try to add something to it. And then, of course, uh, for anticipating some of the topics I'm going to discuss later on, one of which is going to be seduction. And both of you have been touching upon seduction. Now, I can, I can discuss what I'm presenting today about Baudrillard and what I've been doing up until now as an attempt at seducing Baudrillard myself. If you interpret seduction as one way of applying interpretation itself, that's what I've been doing. In fact, nothing of what I'm going to present exists in Baudrillard writing the way it is. I've been kind of reconfiguring Baudrillard thoughts in a sort of a... Um, systematic approach to him. And the reason for which, uh, and I can start my presentation now straight away, is that Baudrillard has been discussing architecture for all of his life, but didn't this didn't become a part up until you yourself, again, thank you, published the book uh, uh, back in 1999, The Anesthetics of Architecture, where you were using Baudrillard substantially to understand and actually criticize contemporary architecture, the way it was developing and the direction it was taken. But again, Baudrillard has been discussing architecture for all of his life. It was prompted by Henri Lefebvre, who said that architecture actually was the, and the British environments by and large, were actually the new field of expansion of um, capitalist spectacle um, beyond what the Franco school used to address as spectacle as such, the new mediatization of the world. And, but nobody actually has been discussing this consistently. And that's why I started my first book by trying this sort of interpretation of Baudrillard by pulling together all his writing systematic themes and then providing my own understanding of it later on in my, in my last book. And 
So one of the reasons for which we should discuss Baudrillard is then again, there is a sort of a constellation of idea if through us through architecture and the work to me has just begun because it goes from uh, singular objects of architecture such as the Pompidou Centre um, or architectural typologies like the drug, the drug store to uh, very niche uh, architectural uh, objects like um, the Studiolo, Federico, the Montefeltro in Urbino, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Up until America, by a large, which is analyzed through his book, America, uh, as an analysis of the urban environment, uh, which is extremely, but still, I believe, undecoded, um, piece of understanding of the enterprise world the way we know it nowadays. So architecture for Baudrillard is not just a second-hand interest, and I'm saying this because for a long time, uh, parts of the analysis of Baudrillard has been limited to understanding whether he was still a Marxist or not, whether he was working within the Marxist tradition, and therefore, whether he was still working within the orthodox way of understanding critical theory, or whether he was doing something different, so possibly engaging with the postmodern culture in the wrong way, so to speak. Actually, Baudrillard said, once interviewed in the past, that to him, architecture was a discipline for which all other disciplines radiate. And that is actually what I'm doing in my work, trying to produce work and understand of Baudrillard. Um, in what way could possibly architecture be moved from his original uh, position or collusion with the system that you have, of course, properly um, addressed and illustrated to a point where uh, architecture with all the massive amounts of tools that he has produced in many centuries can give us a different perspective on the world the way it is run nowadays. Um, so the result of Baudrillard's analysis of architecture is a condition, according to him, where an outside to the system cannot be found, and this is simulation, therefore it's a very complex. Um, uh, situation. Another thing that I would like to address, therefore, what you both have said, Neil and Graham, is the fact that uh, uh, we live in a hyper-reality, but actually what does it mean to live in hyper-reality? And Graham especially was stressing the fact that reading Baudrillard is extremely difficult. And I believe this is one of the reasons for which Baudrillard's interest in architecture has gone unnoticed for many, many decades, uh, because he was using um, writing as an obscure object of desire, so to speak, and therefore was making himself very difficult to, to be understood and addressed. And that's why one of the things that needs to be done uh, is to produce this understanding of Baudrillard of decoding and possibly the application in something that needs to come later. But also the application in itself is not something that Baudrillard would be pleased by because one of the things he didn't want to do was to produce a sort of fast philosophy, fast food philosophy, to use the, the, this terminology, and opposed to fast philosophy, slow philosophy, as much as Italy is now trying to oppose slow food to fast food. He didn't want to be consumed. He didn't want to be co-opted. He didn't want to be manipulated. He didn't want to speed the system far in the direction he was taking, as he happened, for example, to one of his peers, and actually one of his master, Roland Barth, who in the past wrote um, the, the fashion system, trying to expose everywhere how the um, 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 fashion industry was actually taking in place social inequalities, and instead ended up being co-opted by the fashion system itself, which in fact, uh, turn his book into sorts of a Bible for, uh, for the people being involved into the system itself. Um, again, so a part of this presentation is to show the way which I have been addressing Budria, trying to satisfy his requirements for a rigorous analysis of his work, but also one that requires possibly even more than one reading or even just two. It's more, more of that because Budria, again, tends as, as a typical postmodernist, but actually we can say retrospectively that he almost uh, consistently uh, produced an idea of postmodernism itself, writes in fragments. And when we were working together on the first book, because I had the chance, of course, to meet with him, to talk to him, to discuss with him, his work not enough as I wish, unfortunately, because he, he died um, 
um, at a, quite, quite an early age in the past. Um, when we were discussing this, I, I had the chance to understand some of the tricks that he was putting in place in order to make his thoughts even more obscure. So prompted by this, I understood that interpretation, as you call it, we say, is a form of seduction to the point that I would say to, to, to the people who are listening to us, but as a scholar and whoever is interested in poetry art, that the question, as it usually does with something that we give for granted, should be reversed. It shouldn't be about, as Kennedy once famously stated, what Baudrillard can do for us, how can we can apply his thoughts, but actually what we can do for him, in what way we can help him building his idea of a better future and of a better world. Um, so the first things I did was to map Baudrillard and architecture. At least these are the areas of uh, understanding of Baudrillard. Graham, I noticed in his presentation on Benjamin, actually has been able, and I won't be able today because that would just take hours and hours to, to map out the relationship of Benjamin, Benjamin to architecture and its relevance to us. Uh, this is a lifetime project to me. So uh, I will briefly say what I believe are the areas of interest that, that Baudrillard shares with architecture. In the first place, there is the big divide between simulation and seduction. Uh, simulation needs to be seen as architecture collusion with the system and therefore the analysis that Baudrillard produces in order to understand these, uh, uh, these um, uh, this collusion. And it's a sort of an ideological analysis if it wasn't for the fact that whenever we talk of Baudrillard, we can no longer use the word ideology because he was the one who actually exterminated the meaning of the word. He said that in a world where there's no escape, there's no outside, there's not a truer truth to, to the appearances, to what we can understand of reality, there's need, there is no ideology to, that needs to be unveiled, discovered, understood, possibly challenged and replaced. Um, and that is actually the reason why, again, Neil, he, Baudrillard, decided to reject the matrix. He didn't take part into the sequel because he said, you're going completely astray. I wish it was that simple. I wish that Neil would come and understand that uh, there is a, um, a reality being run by a, a computer, supercomputer out there is actually not the way it works. And that's why it's also so difficult to understand Baudrillard. What does it mean that we're living in hyper-reality? What, what does it mean that we're living in a simulation that we're actually shifting from the third uh, order of simulation into the fourth order of simulation. What does it all mean and what does it all entail? And this is part of what I'm trying to explain today through uh, using architecture, especially because I believe that uh, um, Baudrillard's analysis of architecture uh, also triggered his understanding of some of his most famous concepts among which simulation hyperreality itself, which is something that actually he discovered by uh, discussing Nancy uh, at a time of um, the student's revolution was taking place. So simulation on the one hand, as I said, and seduction on the other hand, this is the big divide, which is also analyzed by Rex Butler in his wonderful book on Baudrillard, and where seduction is to be understood and addressed as the challenge to the status quo. So if parts of this, of the work that needs to be done towards Baudrillard is to understand what he's been writing and the way in which he's been understanding architecture and putting architecture in the broader context of uh, life, but also the other way around, our life is put in the, in, the, in the broader context of the built environment, uh, is complicated by itself, it's very challenging. Alongside with this, there is Baudrillard understanding and uh, um, tackling of fine art, and therefore the extermination of architecture by the symbolic gesture, which I will briefly address here. Uh, architecture and politics, which Baudrillard understand mainly in terms of binary opposition, 
uh, for example, the ones he develops between the perspective wind of the trompe l'air, and through these, he manages to explain the way in which contemporary politics works, which is extremely fascinating. I love it. Uh, urban design, architecture and urban design, again, through binary opposition, for example, the, um, the relationship is put in place between the US desert and the anthropized environments being produced by American megalopolis. Uh, architecture and anti-ocular centrism, this is a, a very interesting topic because Baudrillard doesn't make it apparent and at least personally, this entails to me the relationship Baudrillard used to share with Jacques Lacan and other major figure in psychoanalysis, not by accident, not by um, uh, accident, uh, Baudrillard produced his first books under the influence, the methodological influence of Freud or Marxism, therefore the combination of psychoanalysis and psychology and Marxism itself, ideology analysis. So he uses Freud consistently in, uh, in the first parts of his career, but then moving on, I believe he starts engaging more with Jacques Lacan and the way in which he understands the reality of the unconscious. Uh, but this is something that doesn't speak uh, openly and therefore needs to be extrapolated from his ideas. Uh, there are lots of um, elements that relate Baudrillard to Lacan, for example, the mirror stage. Simulation could be interpreted as a form of mirror stage in the way in which he reflects reality as we know it, or the field of vision, or even extremacy, the relationship between inside, outside, or as Graham said obscenity, the disappearance of privacy and hidden things. Everything is overexposed to the point that Baudrillard says that we live in a pornographic world because nothing of our private life now can stay private anymore. And then finally, the relationship between Baudrillard and ambience. Ambience is a word that I'm using today most of the time to explain this sort of consistent trajectory that to me Baudrillard produces by shifting from small scale object to large scale object. Is a word that he only uses in his first book, The System of Object, but is interesting because I believe that encapsulates the idea of simulation and hyperreality itself. And I believe that in his first book, which in fact were the publication of his doctoral thesis, uh, have in, uh, in Nuce, to use a, a Latin expression, in, uh, in a nutshell, was already including many other things that he later developed. So another point of relationship between Lacan and Baudrillard can be found in the fact that both were using certain ideas and then developing them throughout the time. So today I won't be addressing all of these. I will mainly be discussing simulation through this word ambience, which is a way to me to show you how Baudrillard be seduced and possibly continue his work. Uh, Ambience criteria, in order for me to explain what the ambience is, therefore, I've been applying mainly to um, category, if you like. Of course, ambience is more complicated than that. Simulation is more complicated than that. So far, I traced some kind of four different or even five different ways of discussing um, simulation all depending on different viewpoints and ambience is one of these specific points that I'm taking in order to simplify the trajectory in Baudrillard's work, especially for the use and consumption, if I can use this word that Baudrillard, of course, wouldn't approve uh, for students, and especially my students, but also anybody who could be possibly interested in, in architecture. Uh, the relationship between architecture and Baudrillard, but also the way in which architecture, according to Baudrillard, could radiate all the other disciplines, could actually offer an understanding of the world and its political aspects, sociological aspects, anthropological aspects, even philosophical aspects through the lenses of architecture. So this is interesting also about Baudrillard. It works like a sort of a maybe strip. Being within architecture means to go outside of architecture and then back again. So Baudrillard defined the ambience mainly as a sort of a new atmosphere produced within new domestic interiors. And I moved it into a sort of a reinterpretation which becomes an amniotic fluid of polymeric chain on sign, of signs. Um, and I'm going to show how this actually 
may happen within Bodrian. Homogenization and deterritorialization will therefore become important words to understand how these sorts of ambience works. In this development from the code, which is the way in which Baudrillard originally addressed the way in which the environment is produced towards simulation and, there's, and then as an extension, hyperreality and processional simulation, which are all words that he uses in order to make understandable what simulation is in contemporary times. Homogenization. Uh, Baudrillard provides us with some understanding of what homogeneity is in contemporary society. And he uses it apropos of the Baroque stucco that emerges during Baroque time. I'm Italian, I'm from Rome, and therefore I know something about Baroque stucco for sure. One of some of the most wonderful and beautiful Baroque churches in the world are uh, in, in Rome, of course. And to Baudrillard, the, the, the stucco, the plaster, in other words, stucco is the Italian word, but I, I understand it's also used in English. Uh, plaster is the equivalent to 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 Baudrillard is a, is a sort of an analogy is building to the Roman church attempt at unifying the whole world under the aegis of Catholicism. And of course there was an institution in Rome is still in place. There's a wonderful um, building from Borromini, one of the greatest architects of all time. It's a Baroque building. Is close to Piazza di Spagna, and propaganda feed had specifically in mind the idea of producing an hegemonic approach to, uh, to contemporary power, actually to modern power, the modern power of the time through the Jesuits, who were trying to take over. And we, from these, immediately understand what is one of Baudrillard's main understanding of the world nowadays, the way in which you get hegemonize under the same sorts of an ideology. How does it work? How did it spread up? How does it manage to conform the lives of millions of people to it? And then the problem, of course, is the issue at this point becomes how does architecture take part into this process? Uh, personally, as um, my understanding of architecture was to trace back this understanding of, um, of Stucco back to the invention of the perspective window. Baudrillard discusses the perspective window, but not in the way in which I do it, because I stretch Baudrillard understanding to the perspective window. And to me, the perspective window becomes the equivalent of the emergence of double bookkeeping for the newly invented banking system. This is something that Baudrillard discusses all of the time. For example, when he's addressing the Bauhaus in Weimar, he says that the Bauhaus is actually the first way of translating the way in which contemporary capitalism works into contemporary design and contemporary architecture. But I believe that actually it was architecture to uh, make this understanding and this new vision of the world applicable by homogenizing the way in which we perceive space. Before Renaissance time, um, people were not used to perspectivalize the space around us. We're not used to see it as an homogeneous space. But now onwards, space can be measured and it can be reported into the most accurate form of the replication of reality, which is the perspective window itself. And that can be considered possibly the first scientific experiment on the um, accuracy of, of the modern ways of representing reality has been brought about, uh, been, been brought forward by Bruno Leschi uh, in front of the Florence Cathedral. Finally, from these developments, we end up uh, to the domestic ambience, which to Baudrillard is the equivalent of the spread of contemporary consumerist ideology uh, through this idea that uh, commodities can empower uh, the contemporary individuals in his uh, struggle for life, but especially in his struggle to find constantly a better position within the social ladder. So homogenization needs to be understood as the universalization and naturalization of a given ideology at a given time. Uh, by the time when Baudrillard was writing these things, of course, he was under the, the influence and the negative approach to American culture that was taking over Europe. And um, therefore, we can find a lot of that in, in his understanding. Um, but then homogeneity can be expanded into understanding uh, and the entailing of the extermination of difference and the establishment of fake freedom. So that's another big, huge issue that Baudrillard tackles all, those, all of the 
all of the time, and that can be found in his understanding of architecture. In a world that we define as democratic, at least the, the Western world, something that the Western world is so proud about, can we really define ourselves as being free or not? And if this is not the case, as Baudrillard used to believe, how does architecture actually support the system in increasing the number of constraints in our life? The second word is deterritorialization, um, ambience to simulation, which means moving from small um, case studies like interior design, which is the one I'm addressing substantially today, because it's so interesting. However, Bourgeois doesn't really discuss it in, in depth in the way in which I, I analyze it, it is really revealing on the way in which he proceeds. And this is something that I would like to share with you because Baudrillard's methodology is actually one of the things that we should address to make him relevant today. The theme of the, the, the debate today is how is Baudrillard possibly relevant to today's nowadays? Um, the answer is, one of the answer is the way in which he used to go around things, his originality in understanding the complexity of phenomenon that most of the time we take for granted, we take as banal and of secondary importance. Uh, and this is also extremely fascinating about Baudrillard, the way in which he used to point the finger towards things that nobody would actually take into serious consideration, like, for example, a stupid chair in a stupid domestic environments are like many millions around. Um, so we see these sorts of a development that I'm creating. Again, it doesn't happen the way it is displayed today in Baudrillard's books. It's not made so apparent by Baudrillard. You can only sometimes find very small um, fragments of his discussion of architecture. For example, as is the case with Disneyland, that he discusses in half a page in Simulacra and Simulation, but from which so much can be extracted, at least three different interpretations of the way in which he Disneyland, understands Disneyland, which being, one being Platonic, one being Marxist, one being Nietzschean, and the fourth one, of course, being Baudrillardian itself. So there's so much to extrapolate, but the difficulty in this is that this fragment needs to be um, first extracted, analyzed objectively, then put back into the the, the original context and then triangulated with so many other different positions of Baudrillard towards the, the sort of topic he discusses. So we shift from contemporary museum uh, to, to actually the media, where I believe that the ambience takes over. And I'll, I'll show you how um, the, this may happen. A definition of deterritorialization first. Baudrillard uses these terms by extracting it from the the work not of uh, DNG doesn't stand for Dolce and Gabbana, sorry about that. It's a Deleuze and Guattari. And it originally is addressed by these two thinkers, one of which again is a psychoanalyst, um, from uh, uh, the shifting from the social, cultural, economic, and political practices, as well as of people, object, languages, tradition, etc., etc., in and beliefs in relation to their respective original bodies. So all these things, cultural, economic, and political practices are extracted from the original context and moved somewhere else. Why is this happening? How does it work? Is something that Baudrillard is explaining to us. This is actually the role of simulation to produce these sorts of outcomes. In fact, in Baudrillard, deterritorialization becomes something a bit more complex. Uh, as as uh, Neil said, apropos of uh, a spectacle, spectacle is something for Guy Debord, uh, is the idea that we all passive um, uh, actors in front of simulation, we constantly distracted. Graham also made his point, uh, how spectacle keep us completely um, ecstatic in front of the, the spectacle itself in order to distract us, for example, from politics, from other, from other things we should uh, care about because it's our lives that actually is caught in between. Um, so uh, to Baudrillard, um, the territorialization becomes something com more complex and actually becomes the detachment, bypassing and refilling of traditional formal representations um, into aleatory, transient and almost consumerist oriented meanings. What does it mean? Well, uh, it's complex because in the first place, we need to understand that 
uh, to Buria, the whole world become a sort of representation. And again, both Neil and, and Graham stressed the fact that there's no such a thing of reality. And in fact, Baudrillard only said that reality is a form of representation itself, is the last way in which to find the last form of representation, the one that has been going on for millennia now, but then now is being replaced by a new, different form of representation, which is simulation itself. So what is happening to reality? According to Baudrillard, reality is being hijacked is being deterritorialized, become something different. And that's why Baudrillard is so fascinating because the, the issue with reality becoming something different is that we are actually unable to understand that it's becoming such. We keep on believing that there is such a thing as reality and we have familiarized with reality. We trust reality. We think that there's something objective we can deal with when actually it doesn't happen. So what are these consequences of deterritorializing, deter apologies, reality? This is actually Baudrillard's uh, work in explaining what is simulation? How does it work? What does it mean to turn reality into simulation, which means a different form of representation? What is this different form of representation that Baudrillard is there for analyzing, understanding, sharing with us? Is the, the, the new linguistic theory being brought about not really new? Is Ferdinand de Saussure? A linguistic who explains how language works back at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the new century, something that he doesn't write. Uh, one of his scholars put everything together and published the book, The Theory of General Linguistics, that becomes fashionable again during the, the, the around World War II when a new uh, wave in social sciences is launched which is called structuralism. According to structuralism, uh, the, the structural language can be used to understand many different ways in which reality is structured, can be applied to many other different contexts. So life in itself, the collectivity itself can be analyzed and understood as a language. And this is actually one of the principles at work in postmodern architecture. Architecture works as a language, architecture works as a system of sign. But what does it mean that our entire life can be reduced to a system of life? That's the point that Baudrillard is making. Huge consequences. He believes that by the time that this new system of understanding and of representation of reality is put into place, something terrible happens. What happens? The speeding up of the capitalist society to an extent where it's impossible to go back to its origin. But Baudrillard really gets enraged when a semiotician, Emile Benveniste, tried to grant, try and ground the, the theory of the Saussure signs, um, or Saussure sign uh, more into science by proving that is not something abstract. In fact, according to to Saussure, the sign works the following way. Whenever we utter words, for example, the, the term tree, we automatically associate these words with, with an image within our mind. And that's why language works as a system of representation, which is imaginary. Graham said that uh, there's nothing in reality that doesn't exist in our mind. Our mind constantly translates uh, the world around us into images. And we can actually deal with the world because of this. It's a, a neuroscientific principle. So language, whenever we utter the word tree, dog, etc., we can communicate because as a shared system, language actually uh, produces the same sorts of an effect in all of us. And this is the sign, okay? But according to Benveniste, this was not scientific enough because the relationship with an objective world out there was missing and therefore introduces a new element. Actually, the element was more or less there, but Benveniste does his best to stress the, the presence of these elements, the referent. He says, there's something out there to which the sign refers to, which is the real tree whenever we utter the word tree. is already there. And Baudrillard says, you know what? 
This is not true at all, because in a world where uh, we get more and more mediatized, the relationship between representation and reality disappear, evaporate. The, the original relationship between the reference and the signified goes away. And uh, therefore, the deterritorialization reality is deprived by its original content. And this is, is actually, I'm going to show how it works in architecture. What does it mean that we take an elemental form of reality and we translate into something different? So where is the deterritorialization? The fact that a sign meaning something original is deprived from its original referent and therefore is deprived by its original signified to the point to be reduced to the signifier itself which is the word that we utter, but in case of images, is the image itself. We are confronted by an image which doesn't mean anything, or at least whose meaning can be filled with something different. And this is also, therefore, the process of homo homogenization that Baudrillard talks about. Once all the signs are deprived by their original a meaning they all become equivalents because it's the meaning, the content of a specific word, of a specific image, of a specific sign that make it different from the other. When the contents, when the meaning is taken out, uh, nothing is left but a plethora of images or a plethora of signs that look apparently different one from the other, but they in the end are just a chain of meaningless um, signs. And therefore, this is how I translate Baudrillard's understanding of simulation, one of the way in which he may work, an endless repetition of signs whose uh, meaning can shift constantly. Simulation is the equivalence of deterritorialized and subsequently re-territorialized signs, mostly as images, because ours is a society that mainly communicate through images. But again, this is not relevant. This is just my attempt as a scholar to, to put Baudrillard into, into place. Uh, so one of the main examples that he produces, his first one, is the, the shift from the bourgeois interior to the contemporary uh, ambience or to the contemporary um, atmosphere of the houses. But it's something that actually could be stretched and then overimposed to, to the rest of our built environments, and even the way in which they, the world works nowadays. So according to Baudrillard, there used to be a time in the bourgeois interior, of course, he's not trying to defend bourgeois interior. He believes that bourgeoisie brings about capitalism during the Renaissance, not very happy about it. But nevertheless, he wants to show how reality is hijacked. Bourgeois interiors used to be based on fixed hierarchies, all talking about family and society. They used to work in a way in which they were reflecting the order around us. So at that point, really, there used to be a sort of an objective relationship between the language of interior design, but I would say as a student raised in the faculty of Rome in architecture, because we, we don't distinguish in Italy between interior design, architecture, and urban design. So as it's just a, a there's, there's a sort of continuity um, comprehending them within the built environment. So uh, th there used to be a, a time where the science system of architecture, if we, if we analyze this interior in terms of a language, for example, the big sofa in the middle, and then hierarchies all around it, smaller uh, armchairs, and then just the chair without the arms, and then puffs, if you call them that way, the bust, of the, uh, of the progenitor, uh, of, the full, of the full family, the matching of the colors, et cetera, et cetera. There used to be a sort of a symbolic structure of the, of the ambience that reflected the rituals and tradition of work within a given society. So thanks to this symbolization, Baudrillard writes, this is a quotation, is always present to itself. You, are, you know exactly who you are. You know exactly what to whom you belong to. You know exactly what is your place within society. Now, with the new modern interior, something starts happening. And it's funny because one can think, okay, come on, uh, this is stuff from the 50s, the 60s at best, why that should uh, be interesting to us right now? Because we are still working in the same paradigm. And therefore, part of the work that we need to do with Baudrillard is actually to stretch even further his understanding of society. 
which is something that very much goes along the line of what um, um, Eddie Warburg was trying to produce at the beginning of the past centuries with images. Uh, Eddie Warburg uh, had an obsession in a certain way with understanding the way in which classic culture, uh, especially in terms of art and images, what the, was developing within the contemporary consumerist cultures. And he produced the memo scene as a project to understand how the past was being recycled into the present, even manipulated. We put reality just the same. By going back into the past, in this trajectory, Baudrillard was trying to understand how we actually got there. But his work is so rigorous, his work is so thorough that actually by continuing these sorts of an analysis, we can possibly predict how this is uh, further developing. And actually there are a few examples that I'm going to show to, uh, to make evidence how some of these uh, processes are still in place in some of the formats that we are confronted by in contemporary society. So let's go back to the more than in tears at a time when Baudrillard was addressing them. Um, the first form of deterritorialization is the, the use of contemporary colors and especially the pastel color coding being introduced in modern furniture that Baudrillard describes in fact as milky, washed out, desaturated, which is extremely important to him because this rejects the combination, matching, and and contrast of tones at work in the previous um, interior design, the traditional order. Therefore, this is already a form of um, hijacking of original meanings. We still have a kitchen, but the kitchen becomes something different. And I'll show you at the end of this, how interesting is the, the sorts of ideological analysis that Baudrillard is producing about these new interiors. Therefore, the new pastel color coding opposes the ceremonial aspects of traditional interiors, but this is not everything. Also within the modern furniture, we find the modular elements and especially the materials, which bypass, of course, the social hierarchy by an infinite combination and recombination of spaces. So some way there is no longer the sofa in the middle of the, of the room. A, a chair can become a table, a table can become a sofa, well, I wish, but kind of, it may happen sometimes in some form of a stream furniture. There is another world at the regulation of existing social hierarchy, at least, the interior design start reflecting the world in a different way. Everything becomes flexible. Now, what is really flexible within these environments? According to Baudrillard, the idea that the furniture are conveying to us the very um, understanding of the world as a place where actually we can flexibly move from one social political uh, category into another, which is actually what happens when um, the world of commodities spread. Commodities are mainly sold as a way of empowering and enhancing itself, which is actually what we believe we do when you buy a, a computer, a new, a new computer, I wouldn't say Mac, but I was about to say Mac, and I say that, or a, or, or, or a, a smartphone. Uh, so the ideology, what happens here? There are huge steps forward that Baudrillard produced with regard to critical theory and with regard to Marxist ideology itself. Ideology leaves the public domain to enter the, the private domain where we are most vulnerable to the consumerist discourse. And that's one of the ways in which architecture operates. We believe that architecture is there actually to emphasize the separation between the inside and the outside. We believe we are protected. We believe we are protected by our walls, our house. We finally there after our work day out. We home, we can finally relax, we sit in our favorite chair, and by the time we do that, some something happening, something starts happening. What happens that uh, finally ideology operates in ways which are indistinguishable from the means for which it is conveyed. We can no longer understand how we are being imparted by commodities. In fact, we believe we can manipulate commodities, but according to Budria, the opposite happens. In fact, now, for the first time in history, the uh, consumers become a sort of, these are Baudrillard words, active engineer of the atmosphere and ambience. Because for the first time, 
he believes he can, or maybe he believes, dominate, control, and order objects rather than simply possess, use, or consume them as it used to be in the past. So it becomes an active agent. What are the consequences of this? Because of course we can think it's wonderful. It's fantastic. I love it. What's wrong with it? Yes, I can move stuff around. And I need to say, uh, this is not all of Baudrillard's analysis of interior design. Of course, it's a whole book, The System of Object, that explains this, but this is one of the most cogent um, elements of his analysis that I'm using to explain how the ambience works. Baudrillard, now this point, puts into place Freud or Marxism and the idea of magic thinking and the manipulation of the environment. He's using Freud idea because he starts from the... Uh, from the um, very idea that consumers are made to believe that uh, are made believe that manipulation of the domestic ambience can be expanded into the uh, the outer world. How does it happen? It happens because, uh, according to Baudrillard, the users uh, are made to regress to the to their childhood through this very act of manipulation, so that so as children believe that the control of the sphincter can actually imply the control of the environment. And this is the, uh, the, the magic thinking that Bud did, the Freud detected uh, in children aged three years or four years, five years around that time. So at the same, um, the, to the same extent, reducing all this new furniture to fecal matter, Baudrillard says, and in fact it is because all the colors are, are the same everywhere, especially if you access an IKEA shop, you, you will note that most of it is white, so you can combine and reassemble in the easiest way possible. And also the fact that it becomes, uh, it can be combined ad libitum, uh, triggers the infantilization of the consumer itself. And therefore, this is interesting. Consumer are adapted to the new available domestic environments. By the very moment they start believing that they are adapting furniture to the way in which they think a life should be lived within your domestic interiors, the opposite, the opposite happens. Consumers are being trained by commodities by the very time they start using them. So manipulation and control of the domestic ambience fights back because it anticipates the manipulation of the consumer in return. And this is a very interesting way of understanding how contemporary ideology works, especially if then we expand it into hyper-reality and simulation. So it's nothing abstract, it's something that happens for real and actually through our interaction with the environment. And again, if you believe this is something of the past, instead, it can be found very easily into IKEA's clusters, way of selling furniture, the way in which they cluster it by, for example, ambience, the bathroom, the living room, the market hall, et cetera, et cetera. I believe that 99% of, of us has been in an IKEA shop so far. And how are consumers prompted to engineer their domestic environment? Design application, do it yourself assemblage, the active measuring, you go home, you measure, you go back, you don't ask an architect, and this is also something that threats our profession. You don't need an architect anymore, you're the genius, you're the new Leonardo of interior design. Uh, multifunctional whitewashed furniture and predefined combination of per, um, permutation within clusters that are also computers are located in the right place for you to do all the calculations. So you already start being exploited as a consumer because you need to do the double work of consuming, but also decide how to, 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 uh, to combine all these elements together. And again, Graham was making the point in his previous pre presentation about uh, contemporary supermarkets, you access the place by believing you're buying something and then you end up buying a lot before you, you access the exit, especially because uh, within these the, this, the contemporary hypermarkets, but I would say even just uh, a contemporary parking lot, there's not just one, just, just one way to get in, just one way to get out, and you can only get out after you've done the whole tour within the place. And therefore, you have a lot of uh, chances to, to get distracted. Um, the same is happening, actually, within IKEA. Uh, 
But even further, I don't know whether you've already been uh, imparted by Maison du Monde. I know that now Maison du Monde is access in England. It's all uh, already in Italy and a half of Europe. It's interesting because the, the clusters are turned into thematic bubbles where the strings of signifiers are created among the different objects, which means there are itemized typologies, for example, cushions, plates, culturally, furniture, etc., arranged, uh, pre-arranged by themes, which doesn't happen in IKEA, for example, which are, for example, the, the themes of colonial interiors, classic, vintage, industrial, old west, New Yorker, country, shabby chic, but still it is the consumer who needs to think about how to combine them together. So we are at a different stage because you need to think how to combine them, but sorts of the, the arrangements of colors, the combination of colors, the matching is already there between different uh, typologies of items. Now, what is the referent? to use a, a word, a semiotic word, to Baudrillard. What is his precedent? It's the department store. So something happening right now in 2020 for Baudrillard originated back in the 20s, the 30s, the previous centuries, which means almost 100 years ago, possibly even more, with the, with the birth of the department store where something happens for the third for the first time in history, which is the deterritorialization of object, which means object becomes super object, and the super object to Baudrillard, the way in which he defines it, is a sort of a super sign that brings together items, brand names, manufacturers, and display modes. The object is no longer an object. The object is something that speaks about a different content. You access one of the department store, you purchase one of the item, the item doesn't speak the language that you used to speak before. A spoon is no longer a spoon. A, um, a piece of clothing is no longer a piece of clothing. There's something there that starts having a name. It's a whole lifestyle that is being attached to it. But the most important thing is that customers, according to Baudrillard, um, already in 1920s, 1930s, uh, perform a sort of an unpaid labor by linking all these objects in a sort of signifying chains. And that's one of the first way of manipulating the consumer that dates back to that time. Again, what Graham was discussing, that's one of the reasons for which to Baudrillard, you access the place and never leaves with the only object you were originally meant to purchase. Something intervenes along the line for which you get ended up distracted and therefore uh, involved into buying compulsively. You start mentally relating all these objects because they start meaning to you something different from what they originally used to mean. And they, again, we can see this happening in X Factor, which is a wonderful way for illustrating Baudrillard's understanding of deterritorialization and uh, uh, homogenization, but especially this idea of non paid labor within contemporary society, which has been uh, defined during late 70s and beginning of the 80s in a by an American uh, thinker, uh, the presumer. Somebody that produces and consumes at the one at the same time. And that is actually what we do on TikTok, for example, what we get there. What happens with X Factor? Spectacle is sold as a sort of an unpaid labor. There's a double exploitment going on there. The first place, because the audience actively chooses the winner. So they do the job rather than the judges. Uh, which means that recording companies are relieved from the obligation to choose the next star. It's already there. They just need to pick it up and sold it with a, they only need to record the, the record, for example, and it's done. In the past, I remember when the, the Beatles said that at the very beginning of their career, were rejected by record company in favor of uh, another band that only lasts on the market a sort of two or three months because whenever they, the music were listened to, the record company say, oh, you're not going to last for long. That's absolutely not interesting. The same, as far as I remember, happened with the Queen, that, which are now sort of contemporary classic in pop music. Um, so they no longer need to invest the money. They no longer need to waste the money trying to figure out what is going to, to, to interest the public, what is going to last. Uh, this is already done by, by people from home, by, by the audience. 
The process on top of this is fun packed and sold to eyes as a spectacle. So you even watch yourself in the process of choosing the people. And therefore, commodification is accelerated by process of familiarization. Because by the end of, of the of the entire series, you get so attached to the person that you've been pushing and uh, supporting so far, in the end, you really cannot resist purchasing the final product. But even farther than that, this Baudrillard, of course, is not discussing all of this. He died back in 2007. Uh, so possibly these formats were not uh, uh, available at the time. But if we extend his ideas of the signifying chain, the, the clustering of signified, the signifiers, sorry, uh, to what is happening nowadays with... Um, the contemporary, um, the, the contemporary computer culture, we would find something absolutely striking. I get there one day because I was with my friend um, working on a specific, I couldn't find a book in my library. I was asking for help to my friend outside of the country, UK. And I said, I can't find this book. I'm really desperate. And one of them came back and said, listen, I found a PDF on the internet. And I said, where did you find it? I can't find it. So it's right there. The first things that pops up whenever you do, whenever you put the, the name of the book into the search box. And I said, for God's sake, I cannot. And my friend got really irate and said, it's there. Is that possible? You're constantly so distracted by the screen. I, think, I swear to God, I can't find it. Well, it must be the second, the second best or the third. It must be there in the first page of your search box. Say, no, I can't find it. And later I found out it was some kind of 10th page or the 11th page. I said, how is this possible? And then by making further research, I understood that more and more the algorithms um, return to you. Uh, it's a commonplace now. It was happening a few years ago. But it returns to you, your, your, your search preferences, which means create a sort of a bubble around you. And there is a very interesting um, documentary um, on Netflix, I believe, about this, where people previously working for these super um, social applications uh, are deciding to abandon the, the, whole, the whole process. I assume you heard about Facebook in these days. And therefore, the consumers are trapped in customized bubbles of signifying strings. So we're still working within the, um, the paradigm of signifying strings. We're still surrounded by um, um, images. For example, this one uh, popped up in my, uh, in my email account, Hotmail email account, just a few days ago. I was searching for a, an Adobe product, and immediately the day after, <laughs> there were an entire string of, uh, uh, of banners appearing on my computer, one of which in my email account, suggesting which product I should buy. And it goes on and on and on on the internet when I was using the, the mobile. TikTok always, I've been using TikTok only for a few months now, I couldn't resist. And I can see it always brings back to me certain original uh, things that I've done. This brings to um, to another main issue that Baudrillard was discussing by the time internet was becoming um, a widespread phenomenon uh, in 2000, the fact that actually we cannot access the majority on the content on the internet, which is also another major issue with regard to what we call freedom and the idea that all information are free. It's not just about some countries burning some ideas, but actually the fact that we are trapped in our search box or our preferences because the algorithms most of the time doesn't allow us to leave this bubble, which is also a wonderful analogy with how simulation works. You cannot escape the bubble because you create the bubble itself. It's not imposed from the outside. It's being produced by you yourself. You are the prosumer, you are the producer and the consumer of the bubble that you yourself create. And that's the big issue with simulation. That's the reason why Baudrillard didn't want to be co-opted, didn't want to help the system to create a, even a strong simulation from the one he's been witnessing so far. Uh, just to go further with the illustration of how this uh, atmosphere or ambience expands from interior design to, to the rest of the world, 
through globalization and the spreading of images. There is the Pompidou Center, so you can see how I moved from an interior design to a building, which is the next board in terms of size. Uh, Baudrillard writes about the system um, of objects back in 1968, and then 10 years later about the Pompidou Center. Now, there are a lots of books in there, but I decided to shift the Pompidou Center next to the, uh, next to the interior design for this specific reason. He is very ironic about the building, and this is something that architects should really think about, because what he's addressing at this stage is the alibi of functionality that in architecture is almost uh, a password for everything, especially when I discuss with my students, why are you doing what you're doing? Oh, it's functional. <laughs> Whenever they have nothing else to say, <laughs> the last resort is saying that something is functional. Okay, wonderful. It's, it's functioning. No, it's something objective. We need it. What would you want to say about it? Okay, uh, Baudrillard is, is making, uh, is being really ironic about the building. He defines it as a carcass and as an incinerator, the black monolith, an information factory, etc., etc., etc. But because according to him, the relationship between form and function is arbitrary, just as the relationship between the idea of typology in that building, the museum, and what a museum is supposed to be producing, which means culture, is totally relevant to the building. So functionality is only used uh, retroactively to justify sheer spectacle in architecture. The example that he produces for uh, suggesting this is the gizmo. He says that the gizmo is actually well, to be honest with you, Baudrillard doesn't do this. He uses the, the gizmo in a different context. Again, he uses it in the um, in the, the system of object. And as you can see, I am myself deterritorializing Baudrillard, which is another form of seduction of the two that um, um, Neil was showing us before. Um, so I, I have myself been deterritorializing Baudrillard by putting things together were not actually there originally. So not in an objective way, if not in terms of the sort of an explanation was providing, but that it doesn't give us. And so the Pompidou is a gizmo, is a super flexible building, so flexible as ending up being dysfunctional. So this is also something that is really a blow to contemporary architecture. The more we try to be flexible, the, the more we end up being totally dysfunctional. Why is this the case? Because according to Baudrillard, the display apparatus or the building doesn't match performance. And in order to explain this, he uses tail fins in American cars of the 50, where uh, the, the tail fins represent speed, but actually is counterproductive in terms of the real velocity. And the same happens with the Pompidou. It's a wonderful building, super exciting, uh, super innovative, but in the end, does it really produce culture? Does it really does what it promises? According to Baudrillard, no. The Pompidou is only a cultural machine that works allegorically, which means provide the idea of contemporary culture, but actually translate culture into infotainment. And further on, building a Baudrillard ambience in, uh, in, uh, in size, we find the shopping mall, where according to Baudrillard, the deterritorialization of nature is performed. In what way? Well, the shopping mall creates, of course, a city miniature, where you can find everything that you would find in the city center, uh, cinemas, restaurants, food carts, art exhibitions, etc., etc. So it creates a new focus for community life. The problem is that though the shopping mall detach the consumer completely from the environment, we no longer can distinguish the day from the night. We can no longer distinguish the, um, the alternation of seasons, for example. I'm from Italy again, I'm from Rome. There are lots of uh, churches uh, around the place that by constantly uh, playing the, um, what are they called? I'm missing the words, ding dong, ding dong. Bells. bells. <laughs> Thank you very much. By constantly playing bells, uh, remind you all the time. And actually in the past, of course, when the, the, the sort of uh, relationship with the, with the environment, of, of, an agricultural one 
the bell used to remind you when was the time to wake up, to go to work, to go back home, to go to the church, etc., etc. The bell was there to remind us which were our duties within the day. Now this is not happening anymore. You get there, it becomes a sort of a, of a bubble which is cleaner, safer, more regulated than real cities. So we think that's a great addition to our everyday life, but for one thing is the territorializing nature. It's naturalizing something else which is instead completely artificial. Uh, just so, so can we at some point I think we need some time for questions. Have you got much more? Can, is it possible to I am. I, I'm very happy uh, to stop here, if you don't mind, and uh, especially because, for the sake of explanation, I may say much more than I'm actually um, actually putting on display. So I'm very happy to stop here, okay. if you don't like. And well, then, well, I think, I, well, it's been great. I mean, I just think we've got to leave some time for some um, discussion, especially as um, well, let's do this in China. It's midnight already. So um, maybe <laughs> that. I mean, uh, it, that was really absolutely amazing I, I, got, I was scribbling down down notes um uh, uh but i think i think let's why don't we have um uh uh, uh at least some time for us a discussion um do you want to flick through your slides very quickly just go and show yeah. oh just, just very quickly just go like in about a minute just go through okay what so uh, yes the, the the next step forward would be the uh the deterioration of nature then we find with the metro area which is the metropolitan area being developed between megalopolis is the new way where the new the the traditional built environment has been reconveyed so the metro area becomes the model of disintegration of the city through an increased control of the the configuration of the infrastructure and then uh, the hypermarkets, which is extremely interesting case studies in Baudrillard, because there is the deterritorialization of perspectivalism, something that has been going on for five centuries, but where instead a feeling of circular speciality has been put in place and intensified by billboards. And here is really using Lacan, even, even though Baudrillard doesn't say that billboard stays back at you, so you feel in a sort of a panopticon trapped within this place and therefore interject social control. And then Disneyland that we've been discussing where the most interesting things that is the deterioration of symbolic city center, which happens through, um, through the fact that, uh, um, sorry, uh, through the fact that uh, it replaces all bonds within the people. It offers an illusion of uh, overcoming solitude where what is really consumed is a surrogate of proper social relations. So even social relationship and the symbolic city that Aldo Rossi used to address through the symbolic meaning of architecture disappears all of a sudden. And then we have through the media, the deterioration of reality, which is a very interesting case studies because in Italy and probably nowhere else in the world, it was found out that I'll, I'll jump straight to the point, was find out that the terrorists were inspired by um, the Godzilla movie, a remake, the American remake of Godzilla movie, and the original intentions was really to destroy a famous bridge in the United States. They ended up choosing the World Trade Center, first because of its symbolic bearing, and second because it was more easily attackable by uh, airplanes. In fact, two of them crashed of the three that were originally meant to crash against the building. But two, two very interesting things uh, can be said about this last case studies. The first one is that uh, this is an example of the procession of simulacra, according to Baudrillard. We, we've been briefly talking about it, uh, that the way in which we represent the world, for example, through uh, the sci-fi movies from the 50s and then the 80s and the 90s up until the last one on Godzilla, uh, the way in which we've been representing the future is coming back to us in a, in a sort of a dream. We imagine, as Graham said before, we imagine the world, the reality, primarily exist in our mind. Uh, our brain is the first mediatization that we create about the environment. Uh, the second point is that architecture and why architecture, this is so interesting and important to address, why architecture is so in the biggest epochal war of our times. And finally, uh, uh, after all of this, in one of his last writing on architecture, Baudrillard, the one entitled, on the future of architecture, Baudrillard questions, does a Duchamp in architecture exist at all? And um, therefore, 
uh, this question pertains again to the action with which we started, especially yourself and Graham. What is Baudrillard's seduction. One of the possible interpretations is the idea of playing the system against the system itself. Uh, to Baudrillard, architecture really therefore becomes the very field, not art, because he rejects art, disregard art. Art has colluded with the system, but there are hopes for architecture. Uh, architecture can be the very field where the system can be overturned. So again, uh, to Baudrillard, architecture is again, the discipline for which all other disciplines, a new vision of the world really can be imagined. And that's it. Great. Um, thanks, Francesco. Grazie mille. Um, let's, let's, maybe we could unshare and, and have um, a, some, some questions and things. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm intrigued as to whether uh, Philippe um, Morel might have something to say. Philippe is obviously from France and uh, has a certain perspective on things. We, we already have a a question from uh, Marissa, Mar Mar Marissa Bell, um, which I, I think maybe Marissa Bell, we can, we can, uh, do you want to ask it yourself? Um, uh, uh, to, can we, are you able to, can you um, put your screen, your, um, sorry, can, are you able to, to put your, your video on and your, your, your voice on? Um, Maybe oh, she's still there, but I hi Neil. Hi, Neil. Hi, yeah, great. Yeah. yeah, sorry, I can't put my video on. Um, and I just wanted to I, I believe my question actually pertains to some of the final slides that Francesco you you did you did uh show. And I was really curious in this um presentation at some point whether uh, according to Baudrillard, architecture is seen as a system that can serve to undermine that um that's homogene homogenization and 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 um deterioratorialization excuse me that you um so brilliantly have sort of uh, uh presented to us so it was i was just very curious towards the end of your presentation whether this is uh architecture as a mirror of what is uh actually happening or as a source of or a way of moving away from or um, sort of uh, working away from uh, the, these sort of uh, situations. So that was my question, which I think you started to touch on in your final slides. Uh, Marisabel, this, this is very interesting because it goes back to the original philosophical project from Baudrillard, which is the relationship between simulation and seduction. Actually, Baudrillard doesn't see a, a two different fields. One is the continuation of the other because they're all based on uh, on a mirroring, over a process of mirroring. The, the very issues to worry about how you're going to mirror and for what purpose. So the act of mirroring also happens within the act of seduction. He reports uh, um, an analysis of a, of, of a famous philosophical book, which he, he discusses in the way in which the, um, the, the protagonist really tried to win back the woman that he, he, he decided to let go and then uh, um, wants to seduce again. He seduces this girl by mirroring her. By mirroring her, he manages to hijack her from original its original purpose of marrying another guy. Now, the question would be for Baudrillard um, um, to be split in two parts. On the one hand, how contemporary architecture can exterminate itself symbolically as Duchamp with with art by uh, presenting a, a, a urinal, which means a real object in place of the representation uh, in, a, in an art gallery. By doing this, Duchamp said, all art up until now has been based on representation. If I short circuit art by putting a real object in place of representation, representation no longer has reason to exist. Now, by doing this, he also managed to uh, make of art an absolute commodity because when a, when a stroke of genius, the, the Duchamp artworks can be sold for millions. And this is actually the sorts of paradigm we're working within, as Neil said before, uh, by showing the, the shark from, uh, um, what's the name of the English artist, Neil, that did the shark? Damien Hirst. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, uh, so that's one point. So Self-extermination, if you like, or something that uh, exposed architecture limitation. On the other hand, you're absolutely right. In what way architecture can mirror a different wave of understanding the world? But 
this is the question that I'm returning to you as architects. I'm escaping the simple, simple applicability of Baudrillard because we would destroy him. This would turn straight away into a sort of a new style lasting possibly a few months, a few years, and ended up with it. The, the real problem, that the way in which we need to understand this in Baudrillard is how can we make architecture meaningful again? And I'm stopping here because I would like to, to listen to Neil and Graham about this point. <laughs> I, I, I just kind of throw something in there. I mean, I, I think that it was interesting that you and that both you and Graham mentioned IKEA, which is fascinating for many sort of reasons. The one that I, I wrote about many years ago uh, was, was wallpaper, in a, in a sense that what I found interesting was the way that architecture being co opted into these kind of lifestyle bubbles that you're kind of referring to um, into a kind of escapist domain. So I am not so sure that architecture has that resistance. I, my, I personally feel that it's been being co-opted, I, I, but I just want to say that I think these, I mean, identity bubbles, which you refer to, I think is a really, uh, a really super interesting concept that are, I mean, lifestyling and, and so on. And it's a kind of package in some ways. And I, I, I don't think that architecture can escape, but I'd be intrigued to know what, what Graham has to say, because I, I uh, since he also was, was uh, 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 referencing uh, IKEA, maybe I could uh, uh, invite Graham to make some comments. Yeah, thanks, Stu. I, I, I'm, uh... Yeah, I, I really like the idea of, uh, of the Duchamp of architecture. I, I heard a story. I'm not sure if it's true that, uh, but I'm a little, I'm, but I'm a little bit, um, but I'm not convinced that that will will actually uh, be as radical or critical as we might hope. And I, I fear that, uh, as you said, that the powers of recuperation as as, as uh, of uh, of the of the capitalist system are, are such that, in actual fact. Um, uh, even things that seem destructive get brought back in. I'm thinking here, uh, not just of the Duchamp. I heard, because the story I heard was that the, 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 the Duchamp, um, the original Duchamp got, got lost or stolen. And they were very concerned that they'd lost this original. Um, and here is the thing that was uh, the uh, whole idea of it is to rupture and break with the notion of the original and the aura of the original to, to use a Benjaminian term. And suddenly this thing that suddenly has this status of being an original again and being signed by the by the author to give it its originality and its status. And I'm thinking here of um, the fate of a more recent art object, which also seems to break with or rupture um, the, uh, the notion of art. And I'm thinking of the uh, Banksy artwork that kind of half self-destructed uh, a year ago or so at the very moment it was being sold in the, the art auction um, but only half self-destructed um, and I think it's just been sold uh, resold and you sold was it in New York um, a couple of weeks ago for was it 14.3 million or something like that it's actually become the most expensive Banksy uh, of all time. And here you see then something that even art, which is half destroyed or half destroyed itself, actually then becomes something, becomes a collectible, becomes a part of the conspiracy of art, as Baudrillard terms it. So I think even these, these interventions, these breaks, these ruptures actually then become part of the machinery, part of the very element of of uh, of spectacle itself it's very interesting there uh francesco that you you pointed to the x factor right when, when i think of the x factor i, th I think of it as a kind of uh, a stripping away a kind of revelation of the processes of the culture industry as uh adorno and horkheimer and critical theory uh writers describe it the sort of manufacturing of uh, musical acts, musical performers, the coaching of them, the, the uh, transformation of someone who, who can sing into a, into a performer, into a star, X Factor, pop idol, whatever it is. Here we see the very mechanisms of at work of the industry um, producing these figures, producing these songs. And this itself then has become a form of entertainment we're actually watching the industrial production of entertainment as entertainment. Um, and I think the closest thing to this is, is, is for me, is um, uh, that famous moment in, in, um, in The Wizard of Oz, um, uh, 
when the Wizard of Oz, when they encounter the Wizard of Oz for the first time, and there's great spectacle and noise and and um, Toto and and uh, the, the the other the, the um, Dorothy and uh, the Tin Man and the the, uh, the the Cowardly Lion and all these figures are cowering before this spectacle, and then Toto runs over to the side and pulls away the the, uh, the the curtain to reveal the little man who's actually working all these machines. And suddenly, some of the, 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 the spectacle is revealed for what it is. The problem is for us that we've revealed, it's like that curtain has been pulled aside. We've revealed the spectacle for what it is, but the re revealing the spectacle for what it is, we've created a new spectacle out of it. It's like we've seen that this is all smoke and mirrors. We've seen through it. The terrible thing is not that we don't see through it. Actually, this is the point Adorno makes. The terrible thing is not that we don't see through it. We do see through it. We see through it, but we carry on regardless. Um, and that is a terrible thing, that, the, that the, the illusion of the spectacle has become spectacle itself. And we're even more delighted. We're even more delighted by that. It, it that's absolutely spot on agreement. In fact, this is the reason why Baudrillard says there's no way out the, the simulation with the old systems, especially Marx's idea to revealing the truth through ideological analysis doesn't work anymore. And that's why he puts an end to ideology analysis and puts in place something like seduction. So with what Duchamp did and what X Factors does, as you correctly say, uh, even in action of destruction, is returned to the system with interest. And Boudrian asks, as it happens with the Polish, because he got this idea from the symbolic exchange for mentioned tribes, especially Canadian ones in the past. Those that at the time were not being affected at the beginning of the past centuries, of course, because he took this idea from anthropologists. Um, through the idea of the potlatch, if the system returned to us every attempt of uh, stopping it, how can we possibly then return uh, something to the system with further interest until one of the two is destroyed symbolically or in reality? And, and that is actually what he, he means also by seduction. But as much as for simulation, there are many different interpretations about seduction that can be put in place. And it's a hard work to get there because, again, Baudrillard doesn't make this apparent. Perhaps I could just add something. I mean, if, if, to, to to Graham's point, I don't know if you know, but there was a there had been like a series of interventions by artists where they've literally uh, treated the urinal as a new urinal in a gallery, right? And it just kind of shows how much the kind of that has been co-opted by the system. So we kind of find ourselves going down this never-ending rabbit hole, you know, in, in some ways. I just wanted to say something about just to kind of like whether architecture has any resistance. I think the architects like to think they've got resistance, but it seems they're completely co-opted within the kind of capitalist system. Do we have any say? We're working for clients and, uh, you know, and uh, I, we like to think we do, but I, I suspect we don't. But um, no, that was, uh, yeah. Well, uh, Neil, just to add to what you're saying, even worse than that, because we are ideologized to the point that we possibly are anticipating what the what the, the client is saying. For example, now with the huge work that is being done about sustainability, that should be investigated through Baudrillard lenses. What does it mean really to do something sustainable for planet Earth? Which interest are we serving? No, I think I think you're absolutely right. It becomes a kind of way of... of, of um of branding, frankly, in, in certainly in the States, lead certification means very little, but it's a, it's a kind of branding mechanism. Um, there's, there's, yeah, there's a couple of few chats at the comments in the chat. Um, uh, uh, um, I'm not quite sure, T, Marty, whatever. Uh, can we ask about the real? Um, I don't know, I've always been suspicious. So, since Coca-Cola started branding itself as the real thing, I've always been very suspicious about, about the real. Um, Graham, do you want to say anything about the real? Um, oh, no, that's an easy one. Uh, <laughs> I, um, uh, I suppose this is where the, where the kind of more old school critical theory uh, bit of me comes out, that I like to think that we can hold on to things like the real. I like to think that we can hold on to things like rational discourse in politics. I like to think that there is more to uh, the world we live than simply this proliferation and wild circulation 
and consumption of images and representations of all kinds. Um, uh, I think, yes, I would, I would, I would want to hold on to, to a concept of the real because there's, there seems to be something, uh, for me, there is real suffering. Uh, there is real pain, there is real oppression, there is real inequality. These things are not just signs, these are things that are not just images, they are not just text, they are not just forms of communication, they exist and people experience them in embodied ways every day. So yes, I, wanna, I would want to hold on to, to that notion of the real. I think though that what Baudrillard I think Baudrillard wants to hold on to a notion of the real as well. Um, uh, because however far he moves from his early or more Marxist influenced writings, uh, Baudrillard is not unaware of these things. Um, I think uh, we, there are different seductions, uh, different spectacles, distractions, uh, ways of leading us astray from things. But I think, um, I think that, uh, that I would wish to retain in some way the notion of uh, the real and of notions of ideology as well um, in a Marxist sense, uh, the term ideology, uh, because I think that in a way, otherwise we Fall prey precisely to the seductions of capitalism. I think. I think Baudrillard is. That's why sort of the, this, the, for me, there's this duality that we, that when we read Baudrillard, we read Baudrillard as as both a, uh, that we have to take what he says seriously and accurately because he's such a, an amazing um, diagnosis of our contemporary cultural condition, but we have to read it also ironically as well um, because uh, there that we have to we have to see that he's also playing with these ideas at the same time so uh, sorry that's a very long-winded 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 answer but I think I would I would uh, perhaps unfashionably perhaps in a very unbaudrillardian way I don't know but I think I think for me uh, there is a kind of element and a series of continuities and correspondences, curious though they may be, between uh, critical theory and the kind of work that Baudrillard does. And so in that sense, yes, I would hold on to something that there is uh, certainly things that we, we should retain as the real. I, I mean, I certainly think that I, I would want to main, hold on to the, the term ideology. I think it's particularly important in the context of libertarian discourse, the idea of, of freedom, you know, precisely enslaved by that which you supposedly are free from. And I think that's important. And of course, there is no escape from ideology in many ways. Um, but it doesn't mean to say it doesn't doesn't exist. Um, uh, maybe we've got a couple of questions in the, in the chat. I'd like to uh, Iman Sheikh Hassari, I, I'm assuming this is from Iran. How do how do you see the relationship between Ted Kaczynski anti-tech revolution and Jean Baudrillard's idea that there is no escape from simulation. Hmm. And if you want to take that one on, Graham. Well, of course, of course technology is, plays huge parts into the simulation game and uh, even media. I was struck just to, to, to go back to what Graham was saying before that uh, pain is real and suffering is real. But what about pain and suffering being spectacularized, for example, in uh, uh, mediatized events like the life in the slums, et cetera? I mean, everything now can become food for spectacle and everything can, can be ingrained into the, uh, the, the super machinery being put uh, in place by the capital. And the problem is not even mediatization itself, is the fact that everything has been commodified, everything can be sold, everything can be produced, everything can be exploited and we ended up exploiting ourselves so uh, technology is part of this uh Baudrillard was really kind of anti-technologist even even if i don't want to make it sound like this because uh, 
it would make it sound Baudrillard like being a you know an old man not liking really the, the the changes happening within society and we usually associate technology with, with progress and advancement in human mankind but of course the, the problem is as he correctly showed us that by the time everything becomes manipulable and that's the, the real, really the point how do we make everything manipulable and uh, at that point that, that there's no way of distinguishing between a good use and a bad use of something especially if it's done in the name of profit no, I, I think i think that technology is precisely part of the problem in some senses and i, I think from that point of view the identity bubbles you're referring to which are kind of based on the algorithms tracing our, our kind of search history and then inserting us further into those those bubbles that's certainly certainly the case um uh can i just make there's a uh, vasco who's uh, in bangladesh um uh, uh if we are forced to live in hyper reality doesn't that mean we have control over our sense of reality hmm. Well, you're the reality man, Graham. <laughs> uh, uh, just very quickly, uh, to, 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 to prepare the, the ground for, for Graham's answer. Hyper-reality is a way of perceiving reality. That's the point. It's all a matter of perception. That's why Baudrillard was using psychoanalysis in the first place. Now probably we would be using um, a... Um, new studies on the brain and new neuro, neuro studies, but that is actually his interest. Every, as Graham said before correctly, uh, all of reality is, is a matter of perception. This is something that was pointed out by uh, uh, Kant, but even before him, uh, uh, Descartes, uh, that we doubt about our existence because our senses fail most of the time. Reality mainly exists in our mind. The, the, the big difference is between a shared form of reality and an individual form of reality, which um, psychoanalysts address as uh, psychosis, okay? Uh, this is the point that Baudrillard is making. It's not a matter of shifting from reality onto simulation. The reality was better than simulation. The only reason for which uh, um, reality was better than simulation is that it was shared. It was a sense of community and collectivity. And going back to psychology, uh, according to Jacques Lacan, uh, an individual only survives and strives if he, his life can be shared and uh, made public. I mean, there's a social bond. Otherwise, without that, human being and human society would perish. Now, the problem is that the contemporary society is producing something along the lines of what Karl Marx used to define as alienation, okay? Through this uh, sort of string bubble, we get getting more and more isolated in our little, in our little uh, shell, and therefore society is dying. So it's a way of perceiving reality, but the real problem is, is that we get getting more and more destroying social bonds and our relationship to the other, and not just friends or uh, teachers, reality out there, even within the family, this is happening. We're losing what we used to call um, humanity. We're no longer humans. We, we're becoming something different. Now, we may be happy with that, but it's an entirely different issue. Sorry, Graham. No, I think, uh, Francesca, I think you, <laughs> you, 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 you presented it very, very beautifully. I, I also really like the um, way you, you talked about the notion of the bubble uh, in, uh, created by algorithms on uh, contemporary uh, media platforms. And I thought that was... I felt that the observation that you made there was was really important. The one about that this is not something that's been imposed upon us, I suppose. Uh, and this is why I, I'm not really quite clear about the, the way the question is phrased. Is if we are forced to live in hyper reality? I think the, one of the interesting things here is that what you what you identified there in terms of that bubble is is that the algorithm actually constructs it out of ourselves. Um, the algorithm actually produces the bubble around us um, and the more we the more we engage with those media the more the bubble is actually producing uh, is being produced uh, if you like it's being produced as we as we seek perhaps to combat it you know the only way to sort of combat that bubble of algorithms is to make the most random choices possible <laughs> and order the most random goods and see how the algorithm actually tries to deal with that um, so i think i think the um uh, for me, one of the interesting things is about the way we become complicit 
in these systems. Um, the way, uh, you know, just even at that micrological level of the individual, um, and this is sort of, I suppose, why we shouldn't forget Foucault, but we should, we should remember Foucault and think Foucault with Baudrillard. Um, the way in which we, we monitor ourselves, the way we monitor our bodies, the way we surround our bodies and encase our bodies in technologies to monitor them, to monitor our performance, to monitor this uh, level of our, our bodies doing, doing whatever they do, the way we um, uh, turn them into uh, data, uh, the way we, uh, I'm, I'm just trying to think, uh, what is it, create uh, bodily metrics uh, for ourselves, which we then monitor and perform. So in a way which become, as, as Foucault terms it, subject objects of uh, these processes and these technologies. So I think one of the interesting things about this is the way, uh, the way we actually construct these things around ourselves, as well as having them sort of imposed or superimposed upon us. Um, I was also thinking, going back to that notion of the real uh, and, the, and the deterrence machine, and I mentioned sort of the way I thought sort of dystopias might be a kind of deterrence machine. I was thinking of a, a, of a film which I think is, uh, you know, perhaps quite an old film now, but The Truman Show, uh, Peter Weir film, uh, in which uh, Truman is this character in a, in a, in a reality TV series that, that grows up uh, thinking he's living in the real world when in actual, in inverted commas, when in actual fact he's living uh, within a wholly simulated environment. All the other people there are actors. I'm sure many of you have seen this film. It's a, it's a sort of a classic, really. But of course, it's kind of an interesting film because we see both uh, Truman's life inside the, the pleasure dome. We see the TV station and, and executives who are making decisions. And we also see people watching it on, from the outside. In other words, watching it from the position of being the real world. And uh, without us being a spoiler, at the end, Truman finally has a sort of sense of this and sort of like escapes into the real in some way at the end of the film. And this is a sort of, uh, I suppose, an inverted commas, happy ending. But it's kind of interesting because the film itself is a kind of deterrence machine that these kind of reality TV, that, that Truman's actually living inside a bubble in a way. And escaping into the, the real is actually an escape from these forms of entrapment. Um, and I just think there's a kind of another level that we could actually uh, think about uh, those uh, that, that film and the way it works as a kind of deterrence because we sort of see ourselves as being on the outside of it when perhaps there are other ways of thinking about that i think there's quite some interesting stuff going on in the chat it's just it's catching my eye about, I'm reading about it the and notion I'm reading it. It's it's true, if i chop your hand off we can simulate pain i, 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 love, I love the discussion because the, the, yeah, the problem so, <laughs> um so but i so i think i think for me and i'll I just just kind of reiterate sort of my kind of line on this i suppose is is that Yes, of course, I, 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 I would want to cling on, hold on to a notion of the real, but I think the Baudrillardian point is that sometimes it's increasingly difficult, it's increasingly unclear what that involves and what that means and how it works and how we are to understand it. And I think that is, 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 is the problem, that, 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 that what constitutes the real and our experience of the real is increasingly difficult to establish. That's not to say it's impossible, but it's increasingly uh, lost within these other systems of representations um, and, and sim simulations. And uh, again, this notion of procession of simulacra and representations. So I think, it's, I think it's the difficulty of hanging on to that rather than uh, the, the, the impossibility of that. I just want to just add something, Graham. I think, I think uh, just in terms of the Truman Show, if you think about the world as a kind of theme park in a kind of hyper real way, then you know, the corollary of that is we are all uh, playing roles in, and we're role modeling. And when the role models are coming from Hollywood, where they're simulating actual behaviors themselves, we're kind of even further 
lost down that kind of line. I also wanted to kind of throw in there, the, I mean, I, I bar that word about cocoons and things. It's certainly that bubbles and cocoons, whatever. And these could be aesthetic cocoons in some way. I think the notion of the selfie is only also reinforcing that kind of logic of the, of the cocoon. So I think there's something about narcissism that we could take even further in terms of our, our culture today. But um, uh, uh, do we have any, any further? Francesca, do you want to say any final fun? Final thoughts. We should try and wrap things up because we're going on for over two and a half hours. Yeah, very, very quickly. Just going back to the to the notion of reality. Yeah, that both the Truman Show and the Matrix works as the old way of understanding reality. That is the realer reality behind appearances. Well, that is actually the point that Baudrillard is saying. We shifted towards something completely different. The problem is it is difficult to explain in uh, in abstract words what does it mean that is. We cannot uh, no longer make a distinction between the two, but as you as you say, uh, clearly the, the the emergence of fake news or even the the ideas about the pandemic, whether vaccination is good or vaccination is bad, is is a clear example. Uh, both are substantiated by scientific studies, and really becomes difficult to say which which side you should should stand on. And that, that's actually what Baudrillard is talking about. And it's all about communication, technology, perception, etc., etc. The whole of our apparatus of human beings got completely destroyed, get, get, get short-circuited. Whatever we put in place as history, science, objectiveness, let's think about uh, scientific outcomes being faked more and more for the sake of uh, some sorts of, uh, I don't know, getting some uh, um, advantage out of it. It's, it's part of it. But Baudrillard was already pointing at the fact when he was alive that science has already contradicted itself by the 20s and the 30s of the past century with the old theorems about the mathematics and physics and now even uh, even um, uh, quark physics is showing us that, uh, that the world doesn't work as we, we, we thought it was. For one thing, it's not solid because it's full of gaps and holes. Uh, matter is not as solid as we thought it was whenever we, we penetrate it. So the world is completely upside down. But again, it's been turned into spectacle itself. I, I just I think one thing we'd established. I mean, the question I think that was being asked at the very beginning is, um, is, is, is Baudrillard still relevant today? And I think that's the other the answer. I think as I, I think you teased out in a very beautiful way, actually, Francesco is 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 absolutely and one maybe needs to kind of take it further in terms of these identity bubbles, the prosumer, this idea that we're trapped in our search box and so on. I'm just wondering what that what that uh, that modality might take in some senses. Baudrillard was, in a sense, trying to kind of infiltrate the system by, you know, actually surfing in some way the, the wave of seduction. He was uh, engaging with a seductive approach, it seems to me, in order to undermine or understand seduction. And I'm wondering what the next step might be in order to go and like expose that operation. I'm suspecting that maybe it's going to probably um, be operating in the domain of, let's say, TikTok or Instagram or, or whatever. You know, that is e even more so the way that we're operating. And in some senses, you know, we were talking last last week about Trump, but I think in some ways, you know, one needs to do some study about Trump and that mechanism whereby one, you know, uses um, uh, uh, one of these kind of these the Twitter and, and these Twitter feeds to go kind of, to operate. Thing. It seems to me that's the kind of rabbit hole we might be going in and, and maybe it is through Twitter that we might even kind of like expose the logic of that kind of world. Um, I don't know if you've got any final thoughts, uh, um, uh, Graham or, we should, or, 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 um, or Francesco, which, uh, we should try and wrap up because this has been fantastic. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm just I'm just looking at the chat, which is, which is some, some fascinating uh, comments and, 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 and questions and things coming up in the chat. And I think, I mean, for me, I suppose I would say that what um, you know, kind of like if we go back to that sort of term ideology, and if we use that term ideology in a Marxist sense of, of, of systems and false ideas, you know, there is a kind of, you know, the kind of Marxist argument works along the lines of, Frank Kurtz's argument works along the lines of, sort of, you know, that in revealing the world as it is, this is, this is what Marx himself claims to do, in revealing the world as it is, this will dispel false consciousness and we will see the world as it truly is, and that will, will galvanize us and revolutionize our energies. When we see exploitation, we're not just, uh, and we see the explanation for that suffering, when we see the explanation for alienation, when we see the 
catastrophe that is capitalism, um, not just not just on what it does to human beings, but what it does now, of course, you know, to, to the planet and the environment as well, to animals, to, to all life on this planet. When we see that, that we will transform the world, we will see through the lies, uh, we will see through the deceptions, we will see through the illusions. That's a sort of a sort of classic argument. Um, and there's something I, I, I want to hold on to that. Um, at the same time, what happens today when we see through the lies, when we see through the deceptions, when we see through the uh, falsifications of our politicians and leaders, when we see that they are deceiving us, that they are uh, ridiculing us, that they have nothing but contempt for us, um, when we see through that, and yet we still vote for them, they are still popular, they are, uh, they still continue, that there's no consequences for that. How, how is that possible? How is that possible? How is it that critique, this is I think the key thing, how is it that form of critique, which has always been about revealing the real, revealing the true, revealing the way the world is so that we can collectively transform it, what happens when that critique starts to fail or, 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 or doesn't seem to have any purchase on, on a world where lies and deception uh, seem, to, seem to go, uh, we, we see, see, see through them, but they seem either unable to act upon them or unwilling to act upon them, or in actual fact where those lies and deceptions themselves become spectacle and forms of, I don't know, what are they, forms of, to, 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 do they become forms of entertainment? Do they become forms of theatre? Do they become forms of uh, pleasure in some way? Um, that's, that's, the, that's the kind of world I think the Baudrillard actually starts to move us beyond a sort of critical theory to, to actually uh, grasp that world where, where in actual fact that, 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 that even though we see through the lies, we, see, we seem spellbound, uh, fascinated uh, by the liars. Um, and where our usual frames of reference of critique seem to, seem to, seem to, there seems to be a mismatch. They don't, they don't seem to be efficacious anymore. And I think Baudrillard sort of at least kind of starts to alert us to that. And, you know, uh, if nothing else being sort of forewarned is forearmed in some way as, as, as we, as the need becomes more, ever more acute for forms of contestation uh, that can bring about change um, in some way. Um, and I think, I think, I think that maybe the, 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 there is a kind of, at the end there is a kind of deep, deep pessimism uh, in Baudrillard's work um, that, you know, the, the, the old tools of political critique are, uh, have become obsolete in a way, or increasingly obsolete. And that's, 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 that's frightening for me. Francesca, you'd like to, to, to offer a final comment? Yes, thank you very much. Well, you, you were asking me how can we anticipate what is going to happen next? And I think Baudrillard is already answering us indirectly as he always does by putting in place, for example, ge genealogy and understanding the, the origination of a phenomenon. Because in a world where even history becomes irrelevant, possibly understanding within which paradigms we work in it becomes really important. Uh, for example, he set up this understanding of the four simulation orders, and he said, one doesn't stop for the other one to emerge. They all works at one at the same time. So even trying understanding uh, how they overlap, as in the case of this land for which he produces three, three different four different ways of addressing simulation operating in there is extremely important. At this purpose, two things. Uh, the next generation is absolutely important in developing the, the successful tool for this to happen if they really wish for, wish for something to happen. The second, I myself have been putting this in place, for example, with my studio design students by implementing a course called the Trans, uh, trans uh, Transhuman, where we were analyzing uh, the way a mutated, uh, um, a mutated environment in terms of human beings 
in, I don't know, a uh, thousand years from now, but where the origination was happening right now. So there was a critique in the future of something happening in the present to better highlight what is really going on in society. But we had to project it into the future for this to happen. And we've been using both real genealogy, even though the origination of the phenomenon was happening right now. So again, it's something that uh, is at the same time can be seen as catastrophic, but also extremely exciting in terms of what can be done to play the system again itself. We, we've, we're going to have to wrap up now, but this, this, this has been absolutely terrific. So I want to thank you so much. To my mind, what is really kind of, there are many things that have come out of this, but I'm kind of left this idea of some kind of the notion of fascination, some obscene repressed fascination as being something that maybe can be used to un undo Baudrillard in some senses. And I'm, I'm just wondering when he, when he talks about forget Foucault, whether he's more Foucauldian than he'd ever want to admit, um, especially as next week we will be dealing with, uh, with Foucault. Um, Sanford Quinto will be here, who studied under uh, Michel Foucault, and you know, Francesco was obviously spent some time with, 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 with Baudrillard, so it's kind of a continuation in some ways. Also, we have, um, we, we, we have uh, Benaz Farahi, um, we've had three speakers next week, so uh, and Peter McCabe here as well, so it's going to be fascinating. I, I'm just left speculating because I copied uh, Baudrillard, I think there was another book, Forget Baudrillard somewhere, and I, I copied this and I had a book called Forget Heidegger, and that kind of leaves me sort of worried that maybe I'm more Heideggerian than I'd want to admit, so maybe we're all trapped in our own kind of worlds in some ways. I, I, let me just say that this is this has been a fantastic uh, contribution. Thank you so much to Francesco and to Graham, and thank you for the for the questions in the in, in the, the chat. Many of them we, we haven't had a chance to to answer, but there's some really provocative ones. We, we're going to save the chat anyway. But um, uh, t this has been terrific, and I think you know what we're doing. I hopefully is doing is is establishing some kind of like some kind of platform where we can resource that we have for the future. I mean, I was listening to, to Baudrillard the other day, and all he could find were these rather grainy kind of EGS, European Graduate School videos. And it's good to therefore have this kind of uh, mode, this kind of podcast mode that's going to be freely available for everyone in the future. So it, hopefully with this, this library we'll be building up. Last week's was seen by, by several hundred people, at 600 people or so, and I, hopefully this will be building up for the future. So thank you so much for your generosity and contribution. And these are really wonderful ideas that are kind of um have only you know I, we, I think we answered the question is Baudrillard relevancy absolutely but maybe we need to go beyond Baudrillard into another another kind of domain so um so I it just uh, thank you so much and um Graham the, you, and Francesco you're most welcome to come and zoom in or parachute in what the expression is to discussions in the future because these have been wonderful nuggets and I think we've got something that we started something now that is going to hopefully carry on Next week, Foucault, and then we go into, I think it's a, uh, Jameson, who is kind of closely related in some, some perverse way, uh, Derrida, Deleuze, and beyond. Um, so, um, so, and Sixu and, and Judith Butler and so on. So thank you so much. Um, um, and uh, it, it'll all be on, on the YouTube channel. If you just go and Google um, uh, Digital Futures YouTube, you'll have a whole series of these things. And not just this discussion, but also the discussions that took place in the summer. Slavoj Zizek, um, uh, Sanford Quinta, Erin Manning, Manuel de Landa, Anna Maria Calesto, Duran Caresto, and so on. So we're gradually building something up. I want to finish off by also thanking the team behind this. And there really is a team. I always mention this word kind of iceberg. You see 10%, but there's 90% beneath the water, as it were, who are contributing towards this, um, Gustavo and Virginia and many others, Marissa Bell and so on, to make this happen. This is, this, this is, a, this is an act of enormous generosity, um, but I, hopefully this has been appreciated by everyone. Thank you so much, and uh, I hopefully see um, as many as possible next week um, when we start addressing Michel Foucault. So, uh, grazie Francesco, thank you Graham, wonderful to see you, <laughs> thank you. Thanks thank so you. much everybody, thank you, bye now. Bye. Thank you, bye bye. Grazie.